board member have any edits or comments on the minutes? No. I now call for a vote to approve the July 12th, 2022 minutes. July 12th. So, uh, Board with the officer, but he gradually collapsed over the course of 10 minutes before medical assistance arrived to attempt first aid. He was hospitalized and declared brain dead and then deceased. Our staff is actively investigating the deaths, all of the deaths in uh, this year, and we will be convening CHS and DOC together to discuss these deaths and how to avoid them in the future, and we will be issuing another report. The board also expresses condolences for several deaths of department staff since our last meeting. They include retired officer Pamela Martin, retired officer Jimmy Durham, retired officer Joseph Conclave, officer Darchel King, retired ADW Migdalia Montagna, Mary L. Beal, the mother of CO Ryan Gunning. Doreen Angela Barrett Medford, a social worker formerly assigned to the care unit. Retired Captain George Torres, retired Captain Samuel Brown. Retired Captain Herbert Moultrie, retired Officer Earl Gaskins. Retired Officer Mina, and apologies, Officer Donovan Reese, Wanda Sutton, who is the mother of CO Tanisha Sutton Spell, Sadia Issa, the wife of Chaplain Issa Yaya, retired Imam Umar Abu Jamil, retired specialist Kathy Garcia, retired officer George Mason, retired officer Patricia Ann Bakke. We also thank COBA representative Ashaki Antoine for her participation in the board's public comment periods and her consistent
consistent engagement with our staff. Since the beginning of this administration, a number of EEOs have been renewed every five days as emergency executive orders. Renewed every five days based on the emergency crisis regarding staffing in our jails. These EEOs suspend various of our minimum standards, the minimum standards that we established by regulation as the bare minimum that the city finds acceptable for humane treatment of people in custody. The emergency executive orders which are still in place today include EEO 241, which was initially issued a year ago on September 15, 2021. It declared a state of emergency within the correction facilities operated by DOC due to excessive staff absenteeism and staff shortages. It suspended DOC minimum standards relating to the commingling of inmate populations to permit DOC to merely consider safe housing alternatives for the young adults. And it suspended minimum standards relating to enhanced supervision housing to allow the commingling of young adults and adults in that housing. EEO 279 was issued on issued on November 1st of 2021. It suspended our minimum standards regarding involuntary lock-in, in, in other words, time in and out of cell. It also suspended our standards allowing access to the law library. Many other of our basic standards were suspended relating to um, implementation of restrictive housing, including aspects of the new RMAS system. EEO 279 was issued November 23rd, 21, as a corrective um, to make clear that although RMAS would be delayed, that the ESH rules were reinstated. And those are the rules that existed before RMAS and were to be replaced with RMAS. And that needed to be cleaned up because um, it was unclear in the initial EEO. EEO 66, issued in March of this year, um, moved a special housing area where many of our minimum standards had been suspended um, from GRBC to NIC and allowed for the people in custody in that particular area to be locked out. In order to understand how the lack of staff attendance is being addressed and when this emergency might come to an end, we have asked for granular disaggregated data regarding officer attendance ever since February of, the begin of this year. Um, the department has only provided us with top level aggregate data, so we reiterate that request again at this meeting as we have since February. In other announcements, uh, since we last met, the first report of the task force on issues faced by TGN, CNBI, people in custody was released on August 15th. The report um, was authored by Ash McGovern, Deborah, I'm going to pronounce her name wrong and I'm apologizing in advance for that, um, Lole, Dory Lewis, Kendra Clark, Clark, Nick Kincaid, and Sheer Avery. And the group was convened by our staff member, Heather Burgess, uh, who worked tirelessly for quite a long time to facilitate the creation and the release of that report. And as was mentioned earlier, yesterday we released our report on the deaths in custody during 2021, focusing on the suicides and the overdoses and the patterns in those deaths. Yesterday we also welcomed Daniel Luis Ortega to the board um, on her first day of work yesterday. I'm very pleased that Danielle has joined us and some of you may remember her as the OMB Correction Unit Head from 2012 to 2014. Danielle has a passion for criminal justice reform and for fairness in the workplace. She started her career as an AmeriCorps member and carries the values of service to community with her everywhere. She has incorporated DNI training in her work and has worked to ensure fairness among the many teams and many offices that she has managed over her years in the city of New York. Danielle has 13 years of experience managing government budgets, 
including service as the unit head for OMB's correction unit, where she oversaw a $2.3 billion portfolio, as deputy director of budget and grants for the Kings County District Attorney's Office, where she managed a $95.5 million budget, as associate director at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, where she increased the budget by $17 million, managed an office consolidation, and created and staffed a new finance unit. And as director of the expense budget for the New York City Department of Transportation, where she managed a billion dollar budget. Welcome, Danielle. Um, also today, some DOC staff are attending the 28th annual National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, otherwise known as the NACOL Conference. Um, one of our staffers is a board member of that national organization and is attending wearing that hat. Uh, and the other staffer is presenting a seminar um, entitled Violence in Jails and Prisons, Strategies for Oversight and Prevention. Also, our, our Deputy General Counsel, Melissa Cintron Hernandez, will be teaching a continuing legal education course for the New York City Bar this fall. As a member of the Government Ethics and State Affairs Committee of the Bar, the course covers the Freedom of Information Law, also known as FOIL, an area in which she has a great deal of expertise. Some basic census data. Uh, as of September 1st, AMKC has 2,056 people. Bellevue Hospital Prison Ward has 41 people. Elmhurst Prison Ward has no people and no beds. EMTC has 704 people. GRBC has 726 people. North Infirmary Command has 259. Rosie's has 347. RNDC has 803. VCBC, the boat, has 711. West Facility has 71. Uh, for a total of 5,718. Turning it over to Julia. Thank you, thank you. Um, so the board has asked the Commissioner Molina to prepare a presentation updating us on the following. The right is task force and its progress, staff absenteeism and discipline numbers, progress on ESH, ESH reset described at our July meeting. Uh, Commissioner Molina is not present. First Deputy Commissioner. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Comptroller does need to interrupt because his schedule, um, the, this is the only time that he, he can speak. So we're going to have a, a brief moment where we allow his public comment and then we'll move on. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I really appreciate your comment. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Chair, and the members of the staff for providing the opportunity to testify to you today for your flexibility and especially, of course, for your ongoing work to demand accountability in New York City Department of Corrections. Sorry, I'm not glad. George Pagan, Herman Diaz, Sean Carter.
Forest Department so called de escalation units. It cannot continue. I am encouraged that the council, the city council, is soon be considering legislation more strongly focused in solitary confinement by DOC. And I'm eager to make sure that we clearly and firmly prohibit the form of solitary confinement that I saw recently at the Mass City. During that visit, I also asked a DOC and approved by Suicide Watch protocol to prevent recent suicides. And I was assured by the DOC staff that I spoke with that they had taken steps to improve and have things under control. But infuriatingly, we were not told that just days earlier, as we were there, my police officers before we were there, my police officers and county suicide correction officers walking, they went to intervene. He was on life support as we were touring. He died the following day. Now, I know there are staff on my police officers today who are quarantined with space to improve conditions. We met and talked with some of them on our visit, but the reality we must face is death and violence is not abated. While I recognize that the jail population is the result of decision making on the part of many different criminal legal system actors, the Board of Corrections has a critical voice. So, with the data before you now on death, on persistent death absenteeism, and on racial violence, I urge you first to support the protocol publicly for immediate reduction in the jail population, second, to ensure that no person who is placed in the custody of DOC any length of time is ever held again in solitary confinement, and finally, to establish firm expectations for improvements in the rates of violence and death when time comes up to and including the board's supporters for receivership if those targets are not met at this time. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify and answer your flexibility to accommodate me at this time, and especially with the ongoing commitment to bring transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'd just uh, I'd like to uh, take a moment to uh, ask for a minute of silence uh, for those that we lost at the World Trade Center. As you know, this last Sunday was the 21st anniversary of the destruction of the World Trade Center. And to date, we have 28 uniform members of staff from the Department of Correction who have perished, who served over at the World Trade Center. Uh, I never forget that day. Uh, it was primary day in the city of New York, and many of the people that were serving at the primary were also part of law enforcement who were volunteering throughout the city, but they ran to assist quickly down at the World Trade Center, and particularly Imam Umar, who passed away this last week, a week ago, two weeks ago, who was the assistant commissioner ahead, the head of ministerial services in your department. And he served all through that, those, that year at the morgue identifying bodies, representing the New York City Department of Correction. I must say, that the Department of Correction and members of the board were never recognized for the service that they rendered during those 21 years. And I was glad to see that this last uh, September 9th, uh, the Department of Correction had a memorial service uh, dedicated to those that we lost at the World Trade Center. So ladies and gentlemen, I would appreciate if we can together bow our heads for a minute of silence. Thank you. Thank you. So, we're gonna start this again. <laughs>
Sadly, we have lost a few active duty staff members since we last met. I would like to express my heartfelt condolences to the families and friends of our boldest family who we lost too soon. CO Darfell King, Captain Lafatiki Coldwell, CO Donovan Reese, CO Carl Viello, Motor Vehicle Operator Larry Newell, and Program Specialist Kathy Garcia. I would also like to offer my con sincere condolences to the families and loved ones of Mr. Lopez, Mr. Cruciani, and Mr. Nieves. I would like to take this opportunity to provide the board with an update on the department's progress since our last meeting and address items related to the action plan, staff absenteeism and accountability, and the progress on the ESH reset. The action plan is a roadmap to address foundational issues within the department that have developed over years of mismanagement and ultimately create a safer, more stable environment within the jails. We've made significant progress thus far in implementing this plan and we'll continue to work with the interagency task force to problem solve any barriers and collaboratively move all action items forward. In the past few months, we've hired several key executive staff as required by the action plan who come to us with years of experience and expertise in correctional best practices. Mr. Ronald Brereton was hired in mid-May for the role of DC of security operations. Mr. Christopher Miller was hired in late July to the role of DC of classification, custody management, and facility operations. Most recently, we hired Mr. Ronald Edwards as DC of administration and uniform staff scheduling. These leaders will be, a critical, will be critical in supporting the implementation of the action plan and the creation of safer, more humane jails for staff and people in custody. We've also onboarded an associate commissioner of data quality and metrics and other high level positions within our office of data quality and metrics, um, within our office of management analysis and planning as part of our commitment to ensuring that operational and policy decisions are data driven. With the support of this new team, the department recently launched a public data dashboard tracking several key metrics relating to staffing, population demographics, and violence indicators. The dashboard will be updated regularly as part of our ongoing commitment to increasing transparency and public trust. Further, as required by the action plan, we're working to make the facilities safer for people living and working inside them by repairing failing and outdated, outdated facility infrastructure. We have affixed window coverings on 225 windows in RNDC, which restricts access to plexiglass that can be used to make weapons that can cause serious injury to staff and people in custody. We've also been able to install 500 out of 550 new cell doors with state-of-the-art locking mechanisms at RNDC. On restrictive housing, the department is working with Dr. James Austin, a renowned corrections expert, to design a restrictive housing system that adheres to correctional best practices and is ultimately <coughs> approved by the federal monitor. This plan will be shared with the board after it has been finalized and shared <coughs> with the parties. In the interim, we continue to operate ESH housing with operational changes meant to bring the ESH program closer to the spirit of the risk management accountability system while maintaining safety for staff and people in custody. Since the appointment of the new Deputy Warden in Command of ESH, we have seen significant improvements in the operations and overall atmosphere in our restrictive housing units. Individuals in ESH are regularly locking out and engaging in programming with minimal incidents. Individuals in ESH are reviewed on a weekly basis by the programs division for progression into the next level or out of ESH and into a general population unit and that paperwork is being shared with the board. Finally, we've made significant strides with regards to staff absenteeism and accountability. 
Staff ac accountability is imperative in any profession, but especially in professions that hold significant public trust. It is critical that we give our staff the tools they need to perform their jobs, and equally critical that we take action when our staff do not perform their jobs up to our standards. Commissioner Molina has been laser focused on staff accountability since his first day in office. Since January, he has term terminated approximately 160 staff members who haven't complied with department policy, which is more than any previous commissioner regardless of tenure. Close to 500 staff has, have been suspended, which also far surpasses the department's number of suspensions issued in prior two calendar years combined. This department expects professional excellence. Accordingly, all DOC staff, including our leadership team, will be fairly judged against those standards and be held accountable for any failures. However, let me be clear. Our staff will be the game changers that will help turn around this agency. As we hold our staff accountable, it is equally important that we continue to support them. Our staff have one of the toughest jobs in law enforcement, and there is no doubt that they are commi all committed to improving this agency. As we have stated previously, these issues are complex, and it will take bold and dedicated work to implement sustainable change. But we are committed to this task and we are making progress. We will continue to keep the board informed of our progress with the action plan and other improvements in future meetings and regularly update the public dashboard for public awareness. My team and I are available to answer your questions today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, question? Excuse me, Commissioner, have you developed a, a table of organization for your staff as yet? We do have a TO. Um, I believe that is being shared with the board on a regular basis. Most recent? Yes. Our TO is, 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 is done on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis. Correct. And you have the civilian as, and also the uniform. Yes. That, is, that information is being shared with the board members. I can have that sent to you following this meeting. I, w I would appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, many of our, um, many of the terrible incidents that have occurred in the past six months, and uh, including some of the deaths, by our analysis, have been based on lack of staff in the housing areas, not having a B officer present. We still think that we still find that frequently. Could you tell us how many units, housing units, are not staffed 24 hours a day by B officers? We've asked you this question before. You've been reluctant to, to answer it, but I hope today is different. So I don't have that information readily available, but I believe we're sharing information with you with respect to our on-staff posts. No, you're not. So the information, my understanding is that the information is being shared on a weekly basis. Happy to talk to you following this meeting, but our executive director just indicated to me that, that this information is being shared. Well, can you, you, do, you have, do you have information regarding how many posts are not being staffed in these facilities each week? The information that's sent to your office, I have a running numbers of the unstaffed posts throughout the facility. Um, so on September 3rd, it was a total of 27 unstaffed posts. That's covering 24 hours a day? That's correct. Um, I'm happy to forward this okay. to you following our meeting, but this information is being shared with well, the board I, I apologize. on a we, weekly basis. I, I had last known that we had not uh, access sure. to that. So no. I understand. Um, what, what is the plan for um, staffing those 27 posts? So we are heavily recruiting. Um, as you know, we've been working very hard to help management division, ensuring that people are getting um, the adequate care that they need um, and getting back to work. So we've, uh, from the beginning of the, uh, from the beginning of June, we had a, approximately 1,000 staff members out. 
that number is now decreased significantly to 800, and we're continuing to make progress to get people back to work, and in addition to recruiting. We just onboarded a class um, of approximately 115 recruits, and they're scheduled to graduate at the end of the year. And recruitment is ongoing. Have you improved the staffing of units? Yes. Can you give a quantitative aspect of that? Again, I can provide you with the numbers that, that are provided to you on a weekly okay. basis. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I just wanted a question. Uh, why was uh, Commissioner Molina unable to come today? Commissioner Molina had another engagement, and I am here in his stead. Yeah, hi, good morning. I have a couple follow-up questions on that. Um, for the staffing, for the unstaffed posts, would it be also possible to get that by a facility? Because, um, you know, as we all know, it's a large department and absences can impact different departments in different ways. So if it's not already broken up, um, uh, could it be? And then additionally, um, you know, information as well about officers who are working more than a single shift and certainly more than a double shift um, would be relevant if we could get that kind of at the same time. Um, and so specifically not a completed triple, right? Not, not three shifts, but anyone who goes into that third shift um, to get that by facility, I think would really help to complete the picture. Thank you, that, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, and just going back to what you had mentioned about the classes, um, it's great that a new class um, will be finishing at the end of the year. Do you have dates and class sizes projected into the future? And what is the recruitment process looking like um, just in terms of number of people who are ready to enter those classes, who have completed the screening process? Um, is that data available? So our, uh, I can get that information to you. I know that our HR team is working on compiling what the projected classes and sizes would look like. So we can provide that information to you offline. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, during our last meeting, we spent a bit of time um, speaking with the Commissioner about progress that had been made and was being made at reducing violence at RNDC. Um, and I would like to hear a bit more about um, that work, how that work has proceeded over the summer. I'd also specifically like to um, hear uh, your uh, observations around the use of emergency lock-in. Um, which as we uh, reviewed statistics over the summer, we noted that there was a substantial increase, um, particularly in July, in the use of emergency lock-ins at RNDC. Um, so I'd like to sort of hear how you're tracking that, um, your observations on that, and um, how the uh, department is addressing that on an ongoing basis. Um, and also moving forward with the initiatives that the commissioner discussed with us uh, in July. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as you're aware, uh, in the beginning of March, we implemented a violence reduction plan in RNDC. What we saw was there a significant decrease in stabbings and slashings throughout that facility. The facility was merged with um, additional support with staffing and we saw a significant decrease in the numbers of in the violence in that facility. Um, what we've since begun doing is expanding that violence reduction plan to other facilities, which include GRVC. Um, in terms of the lockdowns, I just want to note lockdowns, we've been, in addition to for the violence reduction plan, we've been doing a lot of tactical search operations. And so lockdowns are typically, um, 
in response to tactical search operations in, in the event that we need to search, we need to do investigations, into use of forces, lockdowns are utilized on those bases. Um, but the department is committed to ensuring that we curb the violence within the jails. And so you mentioned the lockdowns increasing. We're using, we're utilizing the lockdowns. It's not as a, a, a disciplinary measure. It's to ensure that the safe, <coughs> safety and security and good order of the facility. Quick, quick follow-up question to that as well. Um, the response time when, when violence So I'm not familiar with the incident that you're referring to. Happy to talk about that particular incident if you can provide details sure. um, regarding that incident. It was at GRDC. It was about 15 people, it was 10 people stabbing the other five people. Mm -hmm. um, they were at the bubble. They hit the door. The bubble didn't open. Um, and the response time. Fourteen, fourteen minutes. Fourteen minutes. Wow. Fourteen minutes. Fourteen minutes. I'm sorry. Fourteen minutes. Um, and I, I can give. I can be more specific, and I, I have some of the minutes here to read. Actually, what happened? I can be, we can be more specific about this incident. It's number um, four four zero seven slash twenty two. And again, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out the uh, other side of the prison. Were they, were they responding to something else at the time? Mm -hmm. when I mean, there's numerous one. incidents mm -hmm. that are happening throughout the seven. facility on any given day. And so in that particular incident, happy to talk to you more about it um, and provide uh, specific details on that incident. Um, but the officers responded to the incident as quickly as they could. OK. One, one follow-up on that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, you had previously, at some point, you had, the department had had a system of having officers who were in the facility, not in ESU, whatever you're calling it this week, um, come when there was a when there was an incident. Now it appears that e ESU was the e ESU responded to this. Do you have a? Is there anything other than ESU when you have a an alarm? Good morning, Dr. Collins. Good morning. Chief Lemon. Um, to respond to your question, um, um, we, we developed a, a strategic response team to assist. Yeah. And we, you know, because That's our chief, due to yes. the fact that uh, EMS, ESU was overwhelmed, you know, um, supporting the entire department. So what we developed was SRT units. We, we had one initially, developed one at RDC that was very successful. It, it worked. So now we just um, set up a unit at GRBC. And um, to go back to this gentleman's question, I believe the incident you were talking about, I think it occurred at like, five, like around five in the morning. Yeah. And that was basically the issue at hand. You know, it, it took a little longer. Usually it might be like three minutes, something like that, but it was, it was definitely a little overextended due to the fact that it happened so early in the morning during the, I think the meeting. So nobody was around at that time? I'm just, I just don't have a, I'm just trying to be kind of the base. No, staff, staff were around, the staff were still coming in, coming on board. You know, so now they, as soon as they were coming in, they were dispatching them down to the unit. And they got there as quickly as they could. Right. <laughs> it, was, it, it was 14 minutes. I just, right. Again, I only say it was 14 minutes. And she watching the blood on the walls of the people that were being stabbed, banging on the bubble, it was just difficult to watch. And, 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 and again, I, I bring it up to say maybe there's ways that we can that happened, we can rectify it and figure out so something like that doesn't happen again. When I saw five men laying in their own blood, 
Um, it was kind of difficult, and, and the last man who was naturally was standing was banging on the bubble, and no one opened for him. Um, it's just difficult to see that and that level of violence um, taking place for that long of a period. And, and just to note, um, as a factual matter, at 521, as the fight was continuing, uh, the B Post officer exited the housing area to enter the aid station. And then for the next 12 minutes, there were no DOT staff present. But there, there was a staff present in the beginning of when they left the housing area. Um, and again, I don't, I don't know the various policies, but, but you know, I, I thought we, we stay there, we de-escalate that, and to see an officer leave that area and allow you know, some of the folks to just continue to stab each other. It was horrific to watch. And, and again, I, I'm sure you know, there will be better processes in place in the future to, to prevent something like that from happening. Right, um, point taken, um, that's point taken. But it was also on post. Right, that officer, yeah. and, and, if you, and if you look at the video, the officer almost got hit, struck with, with a fan, I believe, and threw an object almost hit the officer. So the officer was overwhelmed at that point, and the officer went inside to call for further assistance because it was like, like you said, your number yeah. didn't between 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. 14 um, and 15 individuals. Right, that one officer. So the ratio was, you know, definitely overwhelming. So he went inside. And, and, and I get that. I, I did just think my point yeah. was it took so long. Right, no, no, get no, point taken. I, I get that. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I, I thank, thank you, uh, Felipe, and thank you, Commissioner, for uh, the uh, responses that you've provided. Um, respectfully, I would very much like to follow up. Um, I uh, believe I don't have the precise statistics in front of me, um, but many of the 230-plus lockdowns that occurred in RNDC during the month of July were many hours of the day, perhaps not 24 hours of the day, but 10, 11, 12 hours of the day, long, long periods of time during which young people were locked in their cells. So I would very much like to, I absolutely appreciate the imperative to have safe facilities and also um, appreciate the imperative to have humane facilities and to ensure that um, the young people in RNDC are receiving uh, time out of their cells, are able to access services that are available to them, are able to engage in programming. So I would very much like to um, look at the data with you and follow up with you. Thank you. I just have one more question about the 5 a.m. issue. I'm sorry. No, the 5 a.m. issue, you said that there, there were not a lot of staff were just coming in. The department made a very clear decision a number of years ago to change the lockout time from, from I think, 7 to 10 and 7 to 11 to 5 to 9. That was, and I'm surprised that you didn't change the, the, uh, the staffing at, similarly. Yes. Um, I
Um, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chief. Um, Western Health Services will provide an update now. Uh, we're set to present on that picture. Is that one? Uh, Excuse me, Felipe. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to ask a question on, on the, uh, the staffing. Sure. Before we go to the sure. next item, Commissioner, you you mentioned you mentioned that uh, you were presently doing recruitment, uh, that you presently have 150 uh, correction officers being trained at the academy. Correct. Is this for to alleviate the attrition of the department, that is or correct. oh, it is. Yes. So it's not to get to bring it back to the original. We are working as you are aware to the council did not approve our headcount um, that we requested in the budget for 574 officers. Um, we are continuing to recruit, to backfill the post for people leaving, and we, we, we did not get the additional funding for the 574 candidates that we had asked for. Mm -hmm. So we are continuing to recruit, to manage, um, to onboard new staffing, to assist the department. And this recruitment that you're doing, uh, do you have a schedule as to where the people are going to do recruitment or are you just doing recruitment with the shovel concept? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not following the question. The question is, yes. do you have a list of areas that you're focusing to go and do recruitment? Yes, our, our human resources team has that information on hand and I'm happy to share that with you as well on where they are recruiting. What type of recruiting are you doing? And I've mentioned the shovel concept. Do, are you familiar with that concept? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, I think that sometimes in order to be able to fill positions in a particular agency, regardless where it goes, people just tend to go any place where they can go so that they can get uh, names or get, give out applications to recruit for a particular department. Usually that's really detrimental to the agency because you recruit people that you don't really want in your department. And that's what I call the shovel concept. You just go and you just pick so that you could bring in people. Meanwhile, those people that you recruit, then at least 50% of those are NQs. And then after those NQs, after you do the character investigation, Another 50% are, you know, are dismissed. So you end up with five. Right. So, um, you know, I'd like to know, where is it that you're focusing and going out to do your recruitment for the department? So the uh, department's human resources team, um, the AIU unit, um, the applicant investigation unit. They now you're giving me two different units now. You're giving so me the- the AIU unit, it falls under the human resources uh, umbrella, but AIU is our applicant targeted recruitment throughout the city. Um, they're also, uh, I know that they're working with a, a firm to also recruit individuals in, in addition to civilians, but also on the uniform side. Happy to get that information for you. No, you, are you recruiting for uniform or are you we're recruiting, recruiting for? We're recruiting for uniform and non-uniform, using a, a research, a, a, a team to recruit for both parties. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Obviously, their, their work exceeds 
what their titles are, uh, or a type of usage gene. Um, uh, you asked about sort of the update on infectious diseases. Uh, COVID is still with us. Um, we, as healthcare workers, are still following healthcare uh, regulations and masking and, and following all universal precautions. Um, we did just yesterday receive the bivalent booster, which is protected against the alpha and the two uh, Omicron variants, the variants that are most mostly responsible for, for infections today. Um, our staff, um, Ned Viarius, has trained everybody, so we are we are ready to, to administer that. We're spending this week advising people again to the availability and importance of this, this booster, um, and uh, hope to begin administering uh, next week. Um, currently, our seven-day PCR positivity is about 2.4%, um, and we have 15 patients currently with active infection. Um, the vaccine uptake has been low, um, but it's decreased uh, over the course of time of the, of the pandemic, as it has elsewhere uh, in, in the community and in cities. Um, currently, about 52% of our patients have had at least one shot, um, and 33% currently in custody, and again, this number keeps changing as people come and go. Um, are, fully, are fully vaccinated. Uh, Monkeypox, uh, is, uh, as it's more commonly known, MPV, we, um, we have been screening, continue to screen at our uh, intensively related screening uh, sites uh, across all the boroughs, as well as in all our intake. Um, of course, people can always reach us through the health triage line. Um, we very, very thankfully have no cases um, in the jails of MPV. Um, but we do, in, in large part, thanks to our relationship with our um, health and hospital system, we're able to secure on-site testing immediately um, uh, with, with um, MPV. Um, and again, uh, Ms. Arias has trained her staff, so everybody is ready and able to administer intradermally should we need uh, post-exposure post uh, prophylaxis. We work with the city health department, the OH&H, um, and are assured immediate access should we, should we have that need. Um, and we would obviously work with the Department of Correction um, as needed if there were a case that required some contact mitigation. Um, and the last of the infectious diseases that I wanted to mention is flu. Um, flu season is upon us, um, and we are uh, making that vaccine available in all our clinical intakes. Um, and we'll be rolling that out as, we, as people become more aware that, in fact, summer is over. Um, the uh, other update that I wanted to, to share was um, on Narcan, um, which is a uh, naloxone, um, as people focus on, on overdose prevention. Um, back in December of 2021, CHS proposed and, and got the concurrence from DOC to begin training our patients. Um, we have covered every single housing area. Uh, we've trained over a thousand patients. Um, that number obviously changes as people um, enter the system and, and are uh, released back into, you know, back home. Um, so we do retrain, we've trained um, at least over a thousand people so far, but that, that's ongoing. Um, and Narcan really is, uh, the, the distribution is really part of our KEEP program, which is the country's largest and oldest methadone uh, MD program. Um, so um, we are distributing Narcan also in the visit house. Last month we um, trained and distributed kits to 832 people um, to bring back to their communities. And we think that's, that's a, an effort that we will continue to work with the department in terms of other places that can, uh, we can um, jointly work on distribution and availability of, of those kits. Um, and finally, where we wanted to, our uh, very exciting one is, is Just Home, um, which is our name for our supportive housing project. Um, this is a proposal that we put together with the uh, city's Housing and Preservation Development Agency. Um, and the city recently, um, this summer, announced uh, the Fortune Society would be developing and managing the, this, this program. This is, this is fabulous. Um, it, it would be the city's first permanent supportive housing for people with medical issues who have justice involvement. There is no such thing in the city. Um, people, as you know, would stay in jail um, when they don't need to, only because of, uh, there isn't a robust and a safe place um, to which they can be discharged and care for their medical issues. Um, this, this project would be, um, we're very excited about it, um, would have studio apartments, about 70 apartments um, would be available. Um, really life-changing and, and life-saving initiative, and we're, we're, we're um, engaging uh, elected officials and stakeholders currently in that process, along with HPD and Fortune. Um, I think that's the brief summary, and I can answer questions as, as can the team. Thank, thank you, uh, Patsy. Yes, it's incredible.
incredible the housing project that's being built. Um, hopefully we can get past the community to push that. Yeah, that's that's thank you. <laughs> Very well. Uh, any questions, my boy? So yesterday, uh, BOC released um, the report on deaths in custody from 2021, uh, and it's available on our website. Um, as we know, in 2021, uh, 16 people died in BOC custody, and this year thus far, there's been 13 deaths. Um, and this is never easy to talk about write something called a death report when someone actually dies in probably the worst inhumane place they can in isolation, which is on Yon. I think, you know, I, I, I want to believe that all of us don't want anyone to die on Rikers Island. Um, but the, the, the report kind of highlighted um, some of those things that are preventable that maybe if one of the officers made more rounds, if they miss a round, maybe someone's life will be saved. And it's difficult. You know, folk inside have a loved one, um, and to, to realize that after a week, I'm going to commit suicide, um, that was preventable, I think is the most disheartening thing um, that we talk about, you know, with this report. I want to, I want to, and before I got there, I should, I should definitely thank um, the committee that, that worked on on this report. Um, uh, Deputy General Counsel uh, Melissa Cintron Hernandez and her team. Um, the report, uh, of course, Amanda, Executive Director, and the rest of the team that really put this robust report together to highlight and to allow the city to know that we must do better. And I think one of the things, because this is not a, a at least I don't, I don't want to make this, you know, a, at least at this point, an us against them. You know, these investigations, this board investigation, um, we wanted to figure out how we can prevent this in the future. What can we do to prevent these deaths in the future? And I think that's important to highlight. We want to figure out how do we stop this? You can't go onto the island and die. And you serve a facing a sentence, or serving a six month sentence, or whatever that is. Right? What can we do together to make sure not another death happens? We can't come to the next meeting and I'm reporting on another death when we know these things are preventable. So the report, you know, talks about this, talks about some of the things that we can do. Um, and, and, and again, you know, when we think about it, it's a lot of hopelessness, a lot of despair. Um, and people, you know, suicidal ideations, mental health, um, anxiety, depression, and overdoses. But we gotta figure out how we make these tours happen every 30 minutes the way they're supposed to. How do we make sure that we can prevent, especially a death that's happening in front of a correction officer and they fail to provide support, help. Mm -hmm. Someone can't commit suicide, cut their throat with a razor for 10 minutes, correction officers in front of them looking at it. We, we know, we all know, there's no excuse for that. All of us understand that. Sure. But I just think, you know, for me it's very personal, and, it's a, and it should be personal for all of us that no matter what, we do everything possible to make certain the suicides, the deaths, end on Rikers Island. And we have to do this together. Okay. May I say something? Yes. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think most of us know uh, by listening to the news, CDC has told us that suicide is a, is a national problem. There's been increased suicide attempts. So 
whatever goes on in a larger society is going to be mimicked in the facility. It's just that simple. I, I, my, my question is, and a, and a statement I have, are we trying to increase the number of suicide aids, inmate suicide aids, in the facilities, on all tours, and in addition to that, have alternates for when that inmate goes to court, or for whatever reason, can't work? Uh, yes, the officers should be making 15-minute tours, depending, or 30-minute tours, depending. But there is so much that can go on in an eight-hour period. So that's the reason suicide aids were instituted in the first place. When we had them years ago, I'm former corrections, we, have, we didn't have that many suicides, or they were caught pretty quickly. So that's a question that I have. And before you answer that, I, I do want to also state that um, I think we need to, 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 to look at the showers in the intake, they, they lend themselves to committing suicide because of the gratings. You can, so I think we need to look at maybe reconfiguring those. And uh, my statement is, and it may be, seem a little out there, but I think we should also look at technology. See, what technology is available to curb suicides and even uh, make us aware that an inmate is ill. I not long ago read an article that there's some facilities in the UK that are giving inmates something like a Fitbit. I don't know if it will work with our population, but it's a thought. And it lets you know if they're committing suicide, if, if their blood pressure is low, if, you know, it, it lets you know their health. So whatever we can start doing to look at technology to help the officer who is overworked to do their job and employ the inmates to be suicide aides and maybe pay them a little more than the other inmates are getting paid, I think we should do it. So my question is, are we increasing the number of suicide aides in the department? At this time, we have 35 SPAs in AMKC, um, 12 in GRBC, and RNDC has 10, um, BCBC has 12, and so we're continually trying to recruit um, individuals in custody for this. How role. many uh, housing areas are in AMKC? You said you got 35 SPAs. How many housing areas are there? At this time, I, I don't, you don't know offhand. Lemon, uh, approximately. Three tours. Every house, this three is tours. That's ongoing. You know, it's interesting. You raise this. This is something that yeah. we're, we're talking about internally. This ought to reduce the suicides tremendously. Yes, in addition to the 30 minute tours, we're using the tour. Exactly. For officers when they're conducting their tours. Okay, thank you. Um, just to follow up to that, does the department have a target number for the number of suicide prevention aids that you would need in order to have full coverage so that you could have the observation um, that you need for people in custody who are on suicide watch? Um, and so what is, do you have that number? What is that number? Um, and what are the barriers to recruitment to uh, reaching um, a, a, you know, a fully uh, full complement of suicide prevention aids. Um, so that's kind of one set of questions. You mentioned you had raised the pay. Um, wondering what the new pay is, um, and um, and if that could be a barrier that the department has authority to further address um, by looking at at the pay. There would be about five per housing area. So the question is, how many housing areas are there? You got three tours. So that's three SPAs off the top then you should have maybe two alternates 
for, for when the inmate is not available. So that's the answer to that question. question with respect to what the pay was before. It was a dollar. We've raised it to 145 and we're exploring to see if we can, you know, we'll talk internally to see how we can raise it further. Um, our, you know, priority is staffing the intakes. As we've discussed, this is something that we've ongoing. And so to evaluate the um, staffing and the housing areas that are open, we have to sort of analyze internally as to how we can staff with the SBAs throughout the facilities. Yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up to say I think having, you know, this model has been around for a long time and obviously we're um, seeing with increasing alarm uh, the amount of self-harm and, and deaths by suicide and it seems like that um, would, would be a very compelling reason to kind of immediately come up with, you know, what is the number that you would want and then find a way to get there. Um, you know, with a population of over over 5,000 um, to be able to reach um, that number of needed suicide prevention aids in order to just provide this additional layer of, of protection for people's lives. I, I agree, and I just want to note that there's a, like a screening process. They have to be of low classification. People also have to apply. So we've been doing a lot of recruitment, sort of engagement with individuals in custody about this role, and we'll continue I just want to note that for you as well, that consideration. Thank you. Um, I have one follow-up. Um, under, under our minimum standards, the, the SPAs um, must be in the new admission areas. And I have a question about this, the course of this summer and right now, are there SPAs in all of the housing areas, in all of the areas being used for new admissions at EMTC? Good morning. Um, I currently have SPAs in all of the city's housing. I have it in the liquid observation housing areas. And two weeks ago, they came in and they conducted tests for six housing areas. And I'm waiting for the results right now. So we'll have a surplus. So when they go out into the general population, they'll all be, already be trained as SPA and they'll be able to perform in the facility that they're sent out to. I appreciate that. But my question is at EMTC, in the areas being used, Julio's comments were the most important. I would just like to say that uh, although there is a, uh, an increased uh, rate of suicide uh, in, nationally during this period, the last two cases of suicide, both in the month of August, were not, um, were not COVID-related cases. One of them was someone who, had, who was known to be suicidal, who had attempted suicide twice during this current incarceration, who had come back from the state hospital, killed himself a day, day or two afterwards. The other person was a 68-year-old physician who was facing, who was gonna get sentenced for 20 years. He was housed in a, dorm, in a dormitory which, where there was no B officer. He took his, his, his linen and into the shower because there was no one there. And and hug himself. So these these are these are these are these are preventable. It's a, it's, maybe even if even even if there's a national move, national tendency, they're preventable. But these these were really preventable, and and we should learn uh, that we should figure out what we didn't do to prevent these deaths. So it's 
not on the agenda, but I'm happy to follow up with you after the meeting on the numbers. Um, I had one additional question, or kind of area of questions in relation to the death um, report issued by the board. Um, so with respect to drugs that are coming into the facility, uh, into facilities, um, based on the data and information investigations that DOC is doing, um, what is that showing you um, in terms of where, how the, how the contraband, how the drugs are getting into the jails? Um, and what, um, what methods are you using in order to, to detect them? So, you know, we see that um, searches of facilities have gone up considerably from, um, I think over the course of the year, from about 17,000 to 29,000, um, but, or, I'm sorry, seven, yes, yeah, 17,000 to 29,000, but the actual discovery um, of drugs during those searches have only gone up from about 47 to 55 which just shows like a really low yield from searches. Um, so I'm wondering where else you're encountering drugs, if you're finding them through the mail, if you're finding them in other, other uh, kinds of points besides the in-facility searches, and just generally any information you can share um, given um, the, the impact this is having um, uh, on the population um, and contributions toward the deaths we're seeing in custody. Paul Jackson, the new general counsel, I met many of the board members a week ago. Oh. Um, this is obviously an uh, issue of enormous importance mm -hmm. to us, um, not only because of the suicide issue, but just in terms of the, um, the general population and um, control and um, living a good life. Um, one of the things that has become a priority for us is trying to stop There are other ways that obviously drugs get get brought into the facility. You reported that uh, there was an increase in drug findings uh, when there were no visits.
visits from uh, from family members. Uh, Quite possibly, and we know that occasion you, you find your own officers occasionally. Uh, you know what I mean? My understanding, Mr. Cohn, is we really we get very little um, in the way of drugs overseas, but very little directly from visitors. That's not our problem. It's not coming in through visitation. Um, it is coming in principally through mail, through packages. Um, uh, fentanyl does not make for good reading, um, but we're getting a lot of it now. Well, I. My understanding, and I, I've only been around this jail system for 40 years, that they, uh, drugs come in in many ways. They come in, in civilian staff, they come in, in, in CO staff, they come in uh, uh, maybe in visits, not less likely. And if, you're, if it's true that uh, you're not concerned with uh, um, persons getting drugs during during a visit, you might open up your policy regarding contact visits for people who had drugs in, involved in their, in their, in their past. Um, but um, your, uh, your, your expert um, who's doing, uh, um, who's being brought on by, I'm sorry, I'm losing his name right now, the, uh, the expert who's doing classification for you and the expert who's, uh, who's going to design your restricted housing policy, he has called uh, for uh, scanning of all civilian and officer staff as a way of dealing with uh, lethal epidemics of drug um, overdose in, in, in a jail in San Diego, and the numbers are similar here. So I think that's something the department should consider as well. Uh, I have two questions. And you probably say, okay, here he goes again. How do we handle uh, suicide attempts at the court pens? How you doing, Mr. Reynolds? Um, with that, that, that's a very good question. As far as um, with suicide, basically it all depends on the officer. We don't have SDAs inside the suicide, um, and the student inside the court and trying to detect on um, suicide, but um, that's something that we definitely could look at because we do have workers that, that, uh, that go to, to do sanitation, so we could explore looking to have an SDA inside the courts, but definitely right now at this point, it, it all based on the officer, the correctional officer. I, I think that maybe perhaps uh, the system that you use at the court pens where the officers are vigilant and look for this and prevent uh, the uh, suicides, that maybe perhaps we could implement that in our, in our facilities as well. Uh, I know that in the past there were many people who tried to commit suicide after they woke up after being drunk all day and they, they were arraigned at court and they wake up in a cell in a court pen, this is something that they didn't, could not accept because they let their families down. And as a result, they tried to commit suicide because they couldn't uh, face themselves being in, incarcerated. Uh, and they were probably doing something that they should have been doing to begin with. The, the other uh, uh, question that I had is, what are we doing to, to uh, monitor the, the drugs that come in that do not come in through the mail and do not come in through the visits? Uh, so they must be coming in somehow. Uh, they're either coming in through civilian employees and uniform employees. And uh, are, what are we doing in order to be able to correct that condition? Um, basically, what we do, we reach out to our um, investigation division and have them even come assist us, you know, in making patrols throughout the facility, and especially at the front gate area for um, uniform and non uniform staff entering the facility. So that's something that we definitely do at this point. Yes, ma'am. Um, could we also um, randomly use the canines? Yes, you know, do. just randomly so that if it's coming through employees, 
a billion or a uniform. If they know, like, uh, do they still randomly drug test? Yes. yes. Okay, so that's, that, that worked, right? So random canine units on an ongoing basis might work. And also, um, investigations can plant people. You know, you have inmates that'll tell you what's going on. Do we do that? Is that still done? Oh, yes. sure. It's yeah. Oh, sure okay. It's so. Um, just one follow up question to that. I mean, given the proliferation um, of drugs and overdoses that we're seeing, what of um, those procedures are new? Are there, is any of that um, with respect to screening of, of staff who come into facilities, is any of it new or enhanced, or has the department just kind of continued to um, implement the same screening processes as historically you've done? Um, right now, it's basically just more enhanced, you know, due to the uptick of uh, the drug fines that being introduced. Um, just more or less enhanced and just a better communication, you know, just doing it in real time as far as reaching out to the investigation division. And what does enhanced mean? Enhanced, just uptick, just, uh, you know, just being very aggressive with it. You know, as soon as we get the information, because as you know, most investigations, it takes a little time for them to build cases, so we're very aggressive and continuously reaching out to the um, Deputy Commissioner of Investigations, you know, to put us assistance on, on that. On that level, and then as far as with the um, um, drugs for um, coming in for the person incarcerated, we use our own canine units for that. You know, especially inside the mail room and it's making patrols inside the facility. So it, it's, it's a dual effort on both parts. You know, for the population and also for our staff working. Um, and so, with respect to the screening procedures um, for staff coming into the facility. Um, you, you mentioned it sounds like you're doing enhanced investigations. It sounds like that's maybe after something is um, identified, but what about the front end screening procedures? Has there been any enhancement to those efforts? Yes, um, basically um, um, Special Operations Division took over all the front gates, you know, because um, historically the facility, you know, took it out on the front gate, so Special Operations Division um, took over the front gates at this time, and then we worked in partnership with investigation at times. Like, like I just said, it's an answer. So sometimes, you know, we get a tip or we get a clue, we reach out to them and tell him to also bring his, his team up front. So he'll bring his, his handlers along with his canines, you know, at the front, at, like I said, at the front, um, front gate, and also during inside the um, administrative offices, the corridors, wherever we think, you know, is going. But at that point, we turned it over to investigation division. And, and I, this is something we can follow up on. I have additional questions, but I know we also have a, a long agenda to get to, but some more, we would like more information about you know, actual procedures that have changed. So yeah, just, just to echo what the chief said, you know, all, all members of staff, regardless of rank, they go through a security, they go through a security screening before entering the facility. SOD is, is over all of that process. It's been taken away from the facilities. They manage that process and we work with our partners in law enforcement to investigate any suspected incident in which a member of service may be introducing contraband into the facility and take swift action to intervene and hold them accountable. So I just want to say that. In addition. 
aimed at general mental illness and treatment as well as some of the treatment. Um, and we are continuously talking to our Department of Corrections uh, uh, liaisons as well as internally about how to expand those resources too. Thank you. Just one brief add uh, for, 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 for uh, Board Member Ramos' comments about uh, suicides in uh, in um, units in the uh, in the courthouse units. Uh, the last the, the last suicide in the Bronx in the courthouse uh, was a person. You, you don't count that as a, this person killed themselves. Uh, they committed suicide and attempted suicide in the jail. They were unconscious. They had to go to Lincoln Hospital. They were on a ventilator for a couple of weeks and. Uh, you dismiss them from your service and don't count that as a suicide. Uh, we do. But that man uh, had attempted suicide in the Bronx pens four months before. So, so I think Mr. Ramos's question is, is well taken, and uh, we, you, you, you can see what you can learn from, the, from that, and mental health is, as well in terms of uh, uh, prevention. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move into EMTC Central Intake Updates. Uh, the board is deeply concerned about the overcrowding and delayed e and EMTC Centralized Intake. We have asked each agency to give us updates on staffing and processes at EMTC. At the July meeting, CHS gave us a PowerPoint presentation with suggestions for how DOC could help improve the patient flow. And we have not yet obtained a response from DOC explaining their reaction to the suggestions despite our request. Before we turn to those updates from each agency, I want to address one EMTC problem that we have hoped to have solved this summer, but we have unfortunately been unable to make progress with the department. The board has called for the dismantling of an enclosed lock cage within the showers and the intake at EMTC because it's a great risk to be at people in custody and very dangerous. People in custody have hurt themselves by banging their bodies against the wire cage while locked in this area, harming themselves in apparent protest of being locked in, or because they need mental health services. Theoretically, the cage is used for decontamination, shine off pepper spray after use of force. However, there is no real proper use for this locked cage. A person in custody could easily pass clothing or literature, literature through the gaps in the wires or to hang themselves. It is unreasonably risky. The danger that a person can be left in that locked cage is too high. The risk is too great. <clears throat> An alternative exists. There are showers in the de-escalation areas that can be used to shower after your, uh, your wrap. Intake is no longer the place a person in custody should be stuck after a your wrap. That is what de-escalation areas were built for. Uh, in fact, there are some uncaged more normal showers and intake, right next to the locker room cage. DOC simply does not need the cage. We are disappointed that it has not been dismantled despite repeated requests from this board this summer. So we're gonna ask you again now. Um, so I wanna to turn to the commissioner for, for a response.
shower stalls that are open, um, one after another, with um, sort of brick and mortar in between each of them so that people in custody cannot touch each other when they're in the shower. Um, and then at the end of the row, there is a shower that looks like that, but for the fact there is a cage that has four edges and a ceiling made out of a graded type of metal with holes that are big enough to put a ligature through. And the front of it has a door with a lock on it. So it, it's, a, it's a cage within a regular shower cell that's right next to a bunch of other regular shower cells in the intake area. And what you are saying is that your command level order mandates that after a use of force or a, when there's a need for someone to take the shower, because like you say, they may. No, so if there is, if, if, if there is, that shower pen will not be used for any decontamination purposes. Okay. But what purposes would it serve to lock someone in a cage in a shower area? Again, that area will not be utilized for decontamination purposes. Well, I then I think what the board has been asking all summer is could you please remove the cage because it's bound to be used again someday if it continues to exist. For what purpose would you keep it okay. in the shower? We will, we will, we will, we will remove the cage. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. And I, is there a timeline for the removal of the cage? <laughs> we, will, we will discuss that. We will discuss internally and get back to you on the timeline. Great. I, I think we're all going to rescue here at night knowing that you're Any other comments? On EMTC? Yeah. Well, we, we've, uh, we're aware that uh, through, um, we don't know, I don't know what happened yesterday, but throughout August and in July, there were, uh, our staff and our board, board members visited the, the facilities and uh, in EMTC, the, there was substantial overcrowding in the, in the intake. There were delays in, uh, in, in, in intake and it, uh, People were spend a long time there, and it's a it's a continuing problem, uh, as we as we've described before. I just wondered, uh, uh, do you have a, what 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 are you going to do to uh, move? Is it a problem with the degree of uh, CHS uh, rapidity in, uh, in in clearing people medically? Uh, is it what is it, and how are you going to fix it? So actually. We were 14 to 16 hours on average. We have experienced some delays. We are working in conjunction with CHS. We're sharing their data with ours to ensure that individuals that are running high on time are expedited to the clinic and we follow them through. And we are working together to ensure that they are expedited to the clinic in an expeditious manner. We are ensuring that upon their arrival, they are immediately processed and they are searched and you know, prepared to go to the clinic. And um, over the last week or two, we've worked and our members are getting better. We have work to do. It's work in process, but it's getting much better. Okay, maybe we'll, 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 we'll revisit this because we, we reviewed pictures after pictures after pictures of intake. Right. And, and you know, you've, you've seen the same, you've, you've been there and seen that as well. Well, Dr. Cohen, that's because they come in in large buses. So if they come in at 30 at a time, when you look, you will see 30, but they're being moved in an expeditious manner. I think I, we, we believe that there's a problem and you're working with CHS to resolve the problem, so that's great. Yeah, we're working internally together. We have a good working relationship and we're gonna make it work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. C could I just, could I just yes. ask a question, just following up on that to, I, I very much appreciate hearing that uh, DOC and CHS are working together. And I'm curious as to how you've um, examined what the drivers of delay are uh, in processing folks through um, the intake, new intakes, as well as folks who have already been at EMTC, whom I understand have, I, I visited, uh, 
couple of months ago, EMTC, and in the front of the unit, um, there were a couple of pens with a number of people who said that they had already been through the initial intake process, and they were in those pens, some for extended periods of time, awaiting appointments, awaiting screenings. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in knowing what the dynamic is in that section of uh, the intake and what, what you're working on with CHS in terms of understanding what the drivers are and jointly uh, modifying as necessary your workflows to ensure um, that folks are not in either set of pens, either the brand new admissions or folks who are already um, in the facility uh, and waiting to be seen in the clinic. So, I, I, so the commissioner and Dr. Katz spoke specifically about this issue. And Dr. Katz, my understanding is he's indicated that you know they're committed to sharing data and we are too. And so in that vein, our data teams um, met yesterday and they're gonna have ongoing conversation because data is what's going to inform this discussion and so that's what we've been looking, we're going to be looking at the data that speaks to this so we're able to optimize and ensure that individuals are seen quickly. We've also brought on an individual to do workforce optimization. And so in, in, in the spirit of working through this, in conjunction with CHS, we hope to, with the data, we are able to see where we can tighten up areas of be, people being seen on time and process through intake. Thank you, that's uh, very encouraging to hear. Who is, the, the individual who is doing workforce optimization is a consultant or no, he, is a? we just brought him on our OMAT team. He just started um, yesterday. Okay, well we're certainly looking forward to uh, hearing more about the data sharing and what you're finding. If there aren't other questions about EMTC, one other question that arose um, uh, back when um, I was at EMTC and I believe has persisted is that um, folks are staying at the facility past the 14 days that are anticipated and or the, the maximum of 14 days and um, wondering what you're doing to look into that and to facilitate people who uh, need to be assigned to other facilities moving out of EMTC. Well, we have DC Miller who's onboarded in July and he's head of our custody management and classification and facility operations and he's with us this morning and he works closely with uh, Warden Harvey to ensure that individuals get housed after they meet the quarantine time within EMTC. And so that's an ongoing, that's an ongoing thing, ensuring that people get to their housing areas timely. Welcome, uh, welcome, and I look forward to hearing more about uh, that and reducing the amount of time folks are staying in EMTC in uh, future meetings. Forty slashings and stabbing incidents in August of 2022. 
two less than in the year-to-date monthly average of 42. From June to August of 2022, GRDC had a total of 63 slash and stabbing incidents, approximately triple the rate of the next highest facility, which was EMTC. There were 176 serious injury incidents in the jails in June of 2022, seven higher than the year-to-date monthly average of 169. Do you have a plan to, to counter some of the violence? Kind of what has been working, what, what hasn't been working? Uh, what have we learned? Uh, what is the prediction for violence stats in the coming months? Chief, do you, are you managing this? Okay. Yes. Um, you know, to answer your question, um, we're basically still sticking to the plan. Um, we initiated it at RNDC, um, you know, um, but we have learned because now we can just transition going over to GRDC. That's the building that you said you had, um, the incident building 17. So, um, you know, we're just trying to learn from that. And 
basically, you know, um, I learned to more or less utilize the data, see what, what the main drivers are to some of these incidents. So I'm paying attention to like the, uh, the day of the week, the time of the day, the areas, the SRG affiliations, you know, um, and basically the reason for the incidents and even the staff involvement in it. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to utilize all of this to learn, lessons learned from RNDC to build a better product over there at GRBC at this time. And um, right now, um, what we're doing, we're, blend, we're blending the housing units up. And you know, and, and adults, they told me because you know, I'm there, I'm not working you know, virtually and this and that. I have 10 toes down in these buildings and I'm talking to them and, and the gentlemen are telling me, well, you know, we're not, the, we're not the kids, we're not the young adults. You know, we want to live with, with, with our other SRB membership. So they're giving us pushback, so it's challenging though. But um, you know, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna stick to the plan that the mission believe in us set in place. And that's the bottom line though. And like I said, I'm, I'm gonna take the data that we have and we're gonna learn from it. We're gonna just build a better um, you know, um, product from it at this point. Thank you, thank you. Uh, questions, Jackie? Yeah. Um, do you find that the um, credible messengers make a big difference? I know they're in RNDC, and it appears that they've, um, their being there has reduced violence uh, in the facility. What are your thoughts on the credible messengers and GRBC? You know, um, it's a little different because these guys, uh, these gentlemen, they're much older, so like, you know, but what, what we're working on right now, trying to get some, um, mentorship from outside to come on, you know, like we got different, um, you know, um, faith-based um, groups that want to help. So now that's what we've been looking into them just speaking on, because you got to remember, whatever happens inside the city, it comes over to, um, to Rikers Island. Let's be real about that. So it definitely comes over, but then it's more contained, and it's more, and it's much more challenging. But um, we will see where we are for the task. Thank you. Thank you. The young adults are the future of you know of the of the city. You know, like like they're going to be our, our future citizens. So I definitely like to invest in them. So if you can give me more, you know, messages that that will assist us in, in carrying out this task, we definitely welcome it. Though. units, um, the DOC directive was issued at the beginning of the year. The first placement in one of the units that opened was in um, the end of January at Rosie's. And then over the following months, they opened and are now fully operationalized in all of the facilities to our understanding. And I've seen 
pictures of, uh, of them in all of the facilities. Um, so as per our DOC rules and DOC policy, the stated purpose of de-escalation units is to provide temporary placement for individuals who've been in an incident which requires that they be removed from their current housing area to de-escalate the situation. Um, they may need to decontaminate, um, which as we discussed earlier, means taking a shower after they've been exposed to chemical agents um, to, help, to help get those off of their body. Um, or they may just, the department may just need time to determine what the suitable permanent housing for them is after that incident and who did what and where they should go next. Um, the maximum placement length allowed is six hours. De-escalation unit cells so are, are basically like a regular housing area cell, but the, the metal bed does not have a mattress. Um, people are not supposed to be in there for more than six hours. Um, since July 12th, the department has issued emergency variance declarations um, for more than 43 people. Um, I know there were some this week, I'm not sure how much higher the count is right now. Um, but as of, as of a few days ago, it was at least 43 people who spent longer than the maximum allowable time of six hours in the de-escalation <coughs> unit. And so the board has questions about the use of the emergency variance declarations and why it is so prevalent. But the board is also concerned about supervision issues in the de-escalation areas, record keeping issues, and the continued use of intake areas sometimes as places that people are held after an incident or a use of force. Um, and as we discussed earlier, we were concerned about also the use of intake showers rather than de-escalation showers. Um, so we're, we're hoping that, uh, Commissioner, you might be able to address those concerns and explain what the current state of the de-escalation areas is and what your future plans for it are do you think it's going well? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Anna Robertson, the Executive Director of InterGov Affairs of the Department. Happy to speak a little bit on our progress so far with the de-escalation units. So as the board is aware, the department implemented de-escalation as of July 1st uh, across all facilities. And just a little bit of context um, for the usage of the units, we've had in the month of July and August, a total of 350 placements, and 15% of those placements we have found did surpass the six-hour mark. Um, reasons why that might be the case, oftentimes, um, so you, we are monitoring placement and length of stay in the unit with a tracking system, and we're working through staff sort of training and compliance with that tracking um, system to ensure that when somebody approaches the five hour mark, we prepare for their departure from the unit. And if they approach a six hour mark, you know, we certainly make the board aware. So we continue to work through some staff training and sort of reinforcement around that tracking system, that electronic tracking system. But it is our goal to have that as an electronic system versus logbook so that we can utilize, le you know, leverage technology and actually know when people are coming and going from the unit. So it's certainly some, something that we're um, continuing to work with staff through. As you know, this is certainly new and drastically new operation for the department utilizing these units. We're only a month, two months in now, so we will continue to work with staff so there will be any issues as they come up. Are there any board questions? Um, there's several units where it appears they're not supposed to be, de-escalation units are not being used. Um, is, it, is that the case? So the facilities use, utilize the de-escalation units when, in order, you know, in order to de-escalate after an incident. Now, we found some challenges with that, like certain housing areas, the placement of the house in relation to other houses, like NKC, for, for instance, um, does present a challenge with moving the population in a given house from, perhaps from one side of the building all the way across to the other where the unit is. So challenges like this we're trying to work through to figure out how we can better utilize these units. Um, similarly, if the de-escalation unit identified is not close to the clinic, that presents a challenge for us because of course we need to bring people to the clinic after an incident, right? And that's a priority. So we are you know, working with the facilities. We meet actually on a monthly basis um, with two deputy commissioners who are helping us sort of 
ensure compliance with, with de-escalation, to figure out how we can work around these challenges, and certainly we'll keep the board informed you know, as, we, as we problem solve. I mean, I went to, the, the, I think, the de-escalation unit at AMCC uh, in August, and it had not been used uh, since July 8th. It was filthy. I mean, there was food you know, in the uh, corridor. Um, and I know there have been some places in AMKC in, in August. Yeah. Um, but we'll continue to keep you, of course, you know, apprised. And of course, the unit, w if and when somebody displaced in the unit, it, the, you know, staff are dispatched to that unit to work the unit, so there shouldn't be. Well, I, I hope the case is not that uh, that people are not using the de-escalation units and instead using the intake, which I think they're doing. No, wh where are they where are they taking them? They are either they're either decontaminating in the shower or in the sink per policy, or you know they're going to the clinic immediately after a violent incident. And they're not they're not placing them. In any in any other unit. No, 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 no. Or they're secured in the house after the incident. Oh, I see. Well, okay. Yes, yes, yes. That, 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 that's an improvement, I think. Yes. Um, the other question I have is, I don't understand what your um, emergency variances re represent. Some of them are sure. some of them are days, four, five, six, seven, eight days after the, the event has happened. I don't know what you're what you're declaring Certainly. at that at that point. And if if fifteen percent of the of the, of the people in these units which are going too long. It's not an emergency, it's a routine failure. I mean, I mean it's just the use of emergency is problematic, I think, here. I mean, it's interesting that for the first time in six months, the word variance has come up. Um, uh, but I don't understand, maybe you can explain why you, why, why you are providing us with this variance information, and, and often late. Yeah, so we're, so we're certainly working through the timing of, the, of submitting those emergency declarations to you, but we want to be as transparent as possible. So for instance, when we know that somebody's are approaching or surpasses the, the six hour mark, um, according to the VOC rule, we have to provide you with the reason why. And so then it requires some time for us to communicate with the facility and with our central movement unit, figure out what's the issue, um, and also to figure out what is the exact number of hours they have gone past because if there's an issue with the tracking system, we have to get feet on the ground, we have to look at Genetech to see exactly how long they've, you know, we need to know exactly how, how long they've been in. Um, and so once we have that all information gathered for you, we submit the declaration um, so it's full and complete. I believe that, that our rules on variance say that if you, if you are aware of a, of a problem, uh, which is a continuing problem, and you can't figure out how to solve it without a, a variance, you should ask for a variance. This is not an use of emergency variance. This is a variance request. Certainly, we're two months in, and if you know, if we find that these challenges persist, we'll come to the board and engage in that conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we <clears throat> Thanks. I had a, a couple um, follow-up questions on the record keeping. Mm -hmm. um, you, you noted that you're looking to um, increase the utilization of the electronic tracking system about how well utilized is it now and how long do you think it's gonna take you to get there? Just, you know, I think it you know, speaks to the um, prior back and forth about um, being able to really monitor, especially in real time, how long someone is there. Um, so you know, when do you expect to be um, at 100% utilization? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, the tracking system is something that, right, like it, it's gonna require staff training department-wide, it doesn't just apply to the de-escalation units, but we're certainly trying to leverage it for the de-escalation units. Um, you know, this is gonna be an ongoing staff training matter to ensure compliance with it. You know, if we if we find that it's really affecting our ability to track the de-escalation units, then we'll have to come to the board and, you know, discuss some further path. Could we get the training schedule um, to see the timeline uh, on which you <coughs> plan to train everyone? Sure, I'll speak with the academy. Okay. And then the other question had to do with supervision. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're noticing uh, inconsistent uh, rounding um, by officers um, to check on people who are in the de-escalation units, um, rounds that are supposed to happen every 15 minutes, sometimes only you know, in really extreme cases, maybe one round over a course of several hours. Mm -hmm. um, what is the department um, doing to ensure that, um, uh, first, are you tracking this too? What does your data show? How, how much are officers rounding? And um, 
what what are you doing to make sure that those uh, 15 minute rounds um, are happening? So yeah, the board's aware of the specific instances of lack of staffing and rounding. Please bring that to our attention and we can certainly look into it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm unaware of any specific instance you might be referencing, um, but certainly staff, you know, if, if we are bringing individuals or even one individual to the unit, um, the expectation is staff are present on the unit throughout the entirety and conducting their rounds. Have you noticed any um, uh, inconsistencies with the 15 minute rounds or is the department's understanding um, or is your information showing that those are happening consistently every 15 minutes? I personally have not have not been monitoring, but I know we have folks that are, so we can, I can certainly get back to you and let you know what you know our findings are. We can conduct you know, a proper audit as well, if that's something that we find. Are you, are you conducting or you're saying you could? I can, I can certainly loop back with, with the team that is monitoring the units on Genetech and get back to you. I'm just not monitoring myself. Okay, yeah, I think it's something we definitely have, have found and some sort of a you know, consistent way to make sure that those rounds are happening or to go in and, and check that they have been and mm -hmm. you know, address any, uh, any issues uh, I think would make sense. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I guess if you know someone's going to be there for 20 hours, you might give them access. If you someone's going to be in there for a long time, as happens occasionally, you might get them a mattress. Certainly, never our intention for anyone to go past the six hours. Thank you. Um, I now come to our public comment. Well, before we go there, Oops. I'd like to have one question. Yes. I'd like to ask the Department of Correction a couple of questions. Uh, who's here from programs? Nobody. Nobody. Well, Commissioner, I'm going to ask you then. Our Deputy Commissioner of Programs is not um, here today. Um, it wasn't on the agenda, and um, she had another um, thing to attend, but happy to. If there are any questions regarding programs, happy to get back to you with the answers. Well, yeah. I just want to ask you, uh, I just don't want you to think that we're a crisis intervention group or people that go to, to your facilities to be critical about what goes on in your facilities. But we also like to hear good things. I understand. And one of the things that I was concerned about is that I know that in the beginning, uh, I asked about the summer youth employment program that you were conducting at Rikers Island with the youth. And, and I, they, they gave me a number. And uh, I wanted to know how many of those young people t uh, finished the program, how did they do, and was there any positive documentation in terms of what they learned? or did they get noted for what they learned in that particular program? The other thing is that I want to share with you that I went shopping in one of those in, uh, big uh, shopping centers, and I was standing behind two correction officers, and I was just listening, and they were talking about how they were, they on their own bought some T-shirts for some of the young people that were in your custody, mm -hmm. and how they were, they had a basketball game against an outside community center or something, and and one of the things that really broke my heart was that one correction officer said, "You know something? After the game, our kids came over to him, and one of them said." gee, now I gotta go back to jail. And that was during that time that they were playing that basketball game. They, they just didn't think about the fact that they were you know, in detention, but they were having a good time and they were sharing their experience with an outside group. But at the same time, this was two correction officers that gave of themselves yes. and bought the t-shirts on their own without you guys being sponsoring it, okay? But there's no documentation on that. You know, I think that you should also, you know, you get a lot of negative publicity about everything that goes on in your department. 
but I don't see any good documentation or you don't even invite us to some of those good programs that you have. You know, and I worked with youth all my life and I like to see, you know, and I think I know a little bit about the Department of Correction, but I'd like to see some of the programs that go on there. And the other thing is that what my concern is, your ministerial services, okay? Ministerial services used to be part of your emergency response and security in your department. And I know that, you know, a lot of those people that are in, in and I don't, I'd like to refer to them as those people, but some of the, the young men and women that are detained, they'd like to see two people, their attorney and somebody that represents, okay? So the fact is that we don't hear about this. And the fact is that I want to see more of what you do with ministerial services because the fact is that I know that when we visited the Eric Taylor Center, one of our, the complaints was that they didn't have enough people who represented, you know, the uh, ministers that, of what, that were of their denomination. See. So the, the you know the there are certain things that we're also interested in that it's not just decontamination cells etc which are very important by the way there shouldn't be no problem you eliminating that damn door at that at that at that shower okay but the fact is that I'm I'm also concerned about the the types of programs that you have to because I believe that the more tired they go to bed, the least time they have to think about hurting themselves or to hurt anybody else while they're in those detention cells or dorms or whatever it is that you want to call them. So that, that's a state, I made, I made a couple of statements I, and, and I only asked one question, but I just wanted to, 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 you know, to share that experience with you, Commissioner. Thank you, and I appreciate your your input and we will definitely personally invite you to our programs. I, I just wanted to give you an update on the, um, the summer youth program. Yes. Um, so the initiative went very well. We had 46 emergent adults at RNDC and 10 at RNSC that participated. Um, our summer employment will actually conclude on September 30th. Um, ah, you extended it? Yes, oh, we okay. have extended it. Okay. Um, so each of the emergent adults, they were scheduled to work three days a week, five, five hours each day. Um, for RNDC, we had 71 applicants and 46 were selected. And through July 18 through September 30th, they were paid $1.45 per day and they work five hours a day. And the jobs include sanitation, laundry, dining areas, library, work in the library and also uh, distributing newspapers. Did they learn anything? Yes, and Did they continue to learn. I can have our Deputy Commissioner of, of Programs give you a full-on update. We can meet and talk about it, all the progress that we've seen throughout this, this, this initiative. We're actually having an initiative today um, at RNDC. We're having a baptism. So the Deputy Commissioner of, of Programs, she's there. It's, it's, it's scheduled to start at noon. Good. When, when I talked about program, the chief jumped up immediately. He yeah, won. because we're, we're we're having that uh, we're having that event today, the baptism, and so the deputy commissioner of programs, that's where she is. It starts at noon today. So apologies for her not attending, but I just wanted you to know why she's not here. Thank you, Felipe. Yeah, I'm. I'm um, question. I mean, I my understanding was. That young people were going to be able to apply for some youth employment uh, through the YCB, like young people go into the community, that they do probation, that they do their justice, which I was aware, uh, with a different salary than just a few dollars an hour. Um, why did 
talk to you offline with um, Francis Torres and we can talk through what occurred here. But um, I just want to note that this is ongoing and it's, it's occurring until the 30th of September. But happy to talk about the details and provide you with a substantive update. And when we do that, can, can you also give us an update about schools? Uh, Absolutely. When we met last week, there are only some 15 students in the school. Okay. Uh, and, and big uh, desire to get more young people to be involved. So we'll, we'll, schedule, we'll schedule something with you this week. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're now going to our public comment section. One more question, okay. Um, we're now turning to hear our public comment. Today we're going to hear from people in custody who want to participate in this meeting in their own words. Who will play these statements first and then turn to regular public, public comment. And I just wanted to mention and emphasize, we, we we announced the creation of these dedicated lines in English and Spanish at our July meeting. And I wanted to make sure that folks to mention I just wanted to mention and emphasize actually that the comment line is um, available in English and in Spanish and there is a, a message you hear right before you leave your comment that makes it very clear the purpose is to leave a comment that will be played publicly in this meeting and that there is nothing um, nothing about it will remain private um, if the public comment also includes something that is a complaint. It will have been entered into our data manager system. And I'm sorry. I, there, there is a time for public. There is a time for public comment. You know, ask, once we get started, I, I understand. If 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 the com if the comment that was left on the comment line consists of a complaint that's actionable by us, it will have been entered in our data manager and assigned to a staff member who, who will have dealt with it as, as a complaint as well. But at this point, we're moving to public comment period. The process is we will let people in custody speak first, people who are currently in custody and cannot be with us and left a message on these dedicated lines. Then we will uh, get to people who are here in the audience who have signed up to speak. And then third, we will get to the folks who are online who have signed up to speak. But Denise, if you could move um, to set up, if you could set up the recordings for us, if they're ready to play. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, all. Um, we received a total of six comments from people currently in DOC custody. I will begin by saying them now. This is comment one. Morning, I am an incarcerated person and breaking down DCCC and 
Judith. Judith. Uh, yes, please read the transcript. Okay, get ready. Me. Uh, Judas, please read what you prepared for us uh, through the translation that you did. One comment, um, mostly for the for the public benefit. My understanding is there was a complete verbatim translation from Spanish to English completed for this man, um, and I've, I've seen it. I thought the way he worded um, his comments was quite, excuse me, was quite poignant. Um, and in the future, I, I think it's really important that we have exact translation. I appreciate your summary, but to honor his words, I think exact translation is. And, and in the future, we'll make sure we provide that. It's going to be difficult. No, exact translation. So, thank you all. We have public comments. I'm going to dedicate the last piece of trustee. I have a list of speakers who have signed up to speak. I'm going to call you first names, and I'm going to call you up to the, to the podium. Mostly I wanted to comment about the report and to thank you for a report that gave a powerful uh, 
image of what's going on here. Uh, I also want to thank you, by the way, for some of the tough questions that were asked today, because that is not something I've seen at, uh, so much at the meetings I've attended here over the past couple of years. So it shows a level of interest on your part um, and is different from what I'm going to uh, say about the report. One of the things I found very disturbing in your report is that the recommendations, instead of, the, the recommendations all seem to be about little managerial issues rather than a real attempt to change the environment in the uh, uh, jails, which is so poisonous. Uh, that is not addressed. In your, um, in, in your recommendations. Uh, one of the issues for me is, I mean, since it's so clear that so many of the people who are in the jails are severely mentally ill, uh, or you have many women who we know have had serious traumatic experiences as women, I don't get a feeling for what has really been being done to address those issues. And it seems to me, if you can't address any of those issues, those people should not be here in your jail. Uh, because you're not doing anything that is meaningful to help them to change their behavior and to help them to move on. Um, it's interesting, because this is the first time I heard about the program uh, surrounding uh, folk playing the game outside, uh, involvement in sports and also some of your questions about employment activity. I must say one question I had about that was uh, if someone is working in the uh, laundry, how is that helping them prepare for a job on the outside? Are you really addressing what people need? And it seems to me that that's not so you asked some good, tough questions, and I would like to see some good, tough answers. And so far, I don't see that. And unless you can help people to change their behavior. Um, I must say, at one time, I remember one of the hearings, and I think it was during these times when everything was virtual, uh, one of the corrections officers who testified or who was commenting said something like, we're not social workers. Well, no, they're not. But who, why the hell does somebody need an advanced college degree to learn to talk to somebody, to learn to engage with somebody, to learn to just be a decent human being who is talking to another de potentially decent human being? Uh, lots of them. Because we could hear from the comments they make that the humanity does come out. And so you need them both to behave in ways that are much more engaging than what you have got now. So please, uh, thank you for trying, and, but you gotta do much more. Not just we gotta change the phone system, or not just we got to have a better recording system, but Really, we have to change the culture of the jails. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, can I ask one question or make one request? And that is, I miss almost everything that was said today from you, from everybody. The hearing system here is terrible. And I would hope that, I mean, there may have been good things that I missed. Who knows? But I, I can hardly hear most of this here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, am I on? Thank you. Our next person is uh, Chaplain Phillips. Phillips, everyone calls me Dr. V or Miss V. Um, there's a few things I wanted to 
to address quickly today. First and foremost, I want to say on the record that murder is no accident. And uh, one of the board members today mentioned technology being used to stop suicide. And technology has already been used. Technology showed us seven years ago that officers lack humanity when we looked at police problems. Uh, technology showed us in 2019 that officers lack humanity when they laughed at Lane. Technology showed us just what, a week or two ago that not one officer, but two officers and a captain lack humanity when they allowed an individual to bleed out. And last week at a press conference at a rally outside of City Hall, while in the midst of emceeing, um, I was actually handed a phone that had a private a Facebook group, and I read on the record in real time officers' responses to the last, the 13th death in DOC's custody. And they would say, oh, so he should have split his wrist as well. It would have made him bleed out longer. One officer put in the Facebook chat, this is a group of officers. One officer said they should have took a still pick to pick last longer than the video. Like, these, this is the mindset. And I brought that up for a reason. Because we have a, fe a former federal monitor right now as commissioner. And no, we cannot put it all on this man to make every single officer come back to work and do what they're supposed to do. And I want to straight away, and just last week I was speaking to a couple of captains who was telling me, Dr. D, you know, it's not even about the staff not showing up, it's about the staff who do show up. And one captain was saying, I have an officer I know is horrible at work, but he's still a body that I have to use on that tour. And so right now we're in the midst of of begging for minimum standards. We're in the midst of begging for humanity, but we're not even addressing poor behavior officers. We're not even, we're not even addressing uh, a supervisor having the ability to say, no, you go home, or I'm gonna write you up because you're not worthy to be here and help DOC in the capacity. Care, custody, and control. What does that really mean? You know, when we say that, that means that CHS should be allowed to go after their patient, tend to a patient. But we already know, and I've been in front of you all, all of you haven't been here for the last decade, but I've been in front of this board for the last decade telling you the very things your report showed, the very things the monitor's report has said, and you do not listen. I've directly said officers have threatened me. I've directly said officers are part of gang members. I've even told a board member when drugs was coming in through the kitchen, and it was not even followed up on. So you all have a duty to save lives. You, every last one of you. And I just want to say, it's not a board member that's been a part of this board yet that someone hasn't died. Maybe you. So I, I don't know your name with the numbers. You're very good with the numbers. I'm sorry if I'm, I don't mean to disrespect you, but maybe you. I don't know when you just joined. But all of you have been around and someone has died on your watch. Where's your conscience? You all should be sleeping at breakfast along with the mayor and the commissioner. And the commissioner, he, he, to, he gave you, he told you build bricks with no straw today. He sent you an FEC who knows nothing. He sent you a chief who couldn't give you a correct answer. And they two-step around things because this is what they do. Now, your meetings happen every month except for August and December. This is what I teach the community. But you mean to tell me DOC planned a graduation this year for a BOC hearing, a baptism this year on a BOC hearing? That's by design. The same way you went to visit office to a facility and the officer you used to work with or train was, was taking you on tour, that was by design. You have to take the step and actually step into leadership as the oversight board. You can't hide behind DOC is not giving you data, DOC is not listening to you as an excuse anymore because people died on your watch. You all should be up the block at City Hall raising hell to get the council members to help move things that you can't move along, to get the mayor on board to move things that you can't move along. You have no excuses no more. 30 years, 40 years, it's all amazing. The last 10 years I've been advocating, 20 years working on records off and on in nursing, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. The clergy that they do have there, I love email him on. May he rest in peace, may Allah be pleased with him. He did so much.
that they know is going to follow up, whether it's on the officer side or the, the um, detainee side. I told this board this year that I told DOC to bring back the suicide prevention task force. Now, I'm the I'm co-chair of the New York City Department of Corrections Young Adult Task Force. I've never been a part of the suicide prevention, but I check on it because it's important to me, because they're my community members, because over half the population has a mental health concern. And I do work for the last eight years at the Mental Health Project Urban Justice Center, and also have my own business. And I say this because these are the things that they never followed up. A month and a half later, Mr. Carter died. How many systems failed him from the hospital to the shelter to the courtroom to DOC to CHS? All failed him. There still was no suicide prevention task force brought back. How many people have died since then? How many people have died in special units this year and they tell you they don't have staff? The five o'clock incident, they gave an excuse. Staff was, what, training, um, coming in, going out in the hospital? If someone died and that was the excuse the nursing department would give, we'd be lying. We be liable. Murder is no accident. And if you're in care, custody, and control, that means your life, your heartbeat is at the mercy of the officer on tour. That means it's all of your responsibilities to make sure they're doing their job, they're following protocols, and they're upholding minimum standards. You have to do better. You have to do better. And whether there's a suicide aid on watch or not, DOC and CHS is responsible for that life. Bottom line. No excuses. Too many people have died. Officers, the culture has not changed. What are we doing here? You allow DOC to get up and walk out, they didn't even have their hair. And then you play the beat, you play the book and encase them. All the years I have played uh, testimony from people detained, you have never heard me play a book and encase number on the record. I tell you, if you want to know who this person is directly, I'll give you the information off the record. You literally can't protect people right now, but you put that person's name, the book and case number, and their issues for them to be beat down before you even show up. Do you even go to the facilities that you, that you get these calls from? You're putting their life in jeopardy. Now, I beg for them to have their voice on the record, but not for them to be beat down and, 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 and discarded because you're not doing your job and you're failing in leadership at this. Like, you can't keep my community safe. You can't. You're not, you're not there. You're not there. And FTC, she told, FTC knew that you were going to ask questions that DC tourists would be able to answer. There was a reason she was not here. Exactly. And did you, we were not told it was going to get paid no $1.45, because I would have raised hell in the meeting when we was designing the, the job program to come. So they need to stick to what they say and follow up. And everything started yesterday. I brought that up on the record years, for years now. They know the meetings happen, but they always start stuff that you want to ask about. Oh, we implemented that yesterday. We began that yesterday. Follow up. Sleep. Get your sleeping bags and go to Rikers. Please. My community members need you. And he was right. Clergy has to expand, because I told them that as well. It can't just be people who are unrelatable that, that you think that the population is going to speak to and, and bond with. So thank you for raising that. Please, save lives. Lives in real time. You got to get it together. Politics, put it to the side. Because when you go to sleep at night, you need to understand you are responsible. You have a legacy right now. You are a powerful group. It does not matter where you came from, what you're doing as a collective. Who are you holding responsible in this city? What will your grandchildren and your family speak about you when they talk about correction and you being a part of BOC? Peace and blessings. Save a life. My name is Leah Zaria, and I am the senior community organizer with the Women's Community Justice Association. And we lead the Beyond, hashtag Beyond Rosie's campaign 
advocating for the women and the gender expansive population at the Bosom Singer Center on Rikers Island. The first pillar of our campaign is to concentrate these mothers, daughters, and sisters who are particularly vulnerable in jail. I was detained at Rosie's for nearly three years, starting in 1997. I was only 23 years old, a single mom who was suffering from trauma of an abusive relationship. Now, I visit regularly in my role with WCJA, and the stories of the women are still all too familiar. They're just like mine. The women and the gender expansive population at Rosie's are from black and brown communities. With the fewest resources, many are domestic violence victims, and most are mothers and caregivers. In June, WCJA released a report with the Lipman Commission called Path to Under 100 that showed who was at Rosie's. Some of the findings were that Harlem, East New York, Brownsville, in Brooklyn, and South Bronx had the highest admissions to Rosie's over the past five years. 82% of women had mental health diagnosis, compared to 49% of the men at Rikers. Up to 93% had experienced physical, sexual, and or emotional violence. 70% were parents, compared to 40% of men. And most had children under the age of 18. Most are erosies for a short amount of time. The medium length of stay was only 13 days. One third were there because they couldn't afford $5,000 or less of bail. 22% were erosies or nonviolent charges, mostly related to drugs and property crime. Women and gender expensive people are particularly vulnerable in jail. The death of Mary Yehuda this made was a tragedy and never should have happened. There must be a focus on decarceration and safely releasing as many with community-based support. Right now, there are 347 women and gender expansive people at Rosie's. The city's plan to close Rikers aims for 100 and the path to under 100 report is a plan to get the population even lower. New York City can get there. At the height of COVID, the city decreased the number at Rosie's to 149. At that time, the Board of Corrections issued a call for decarceration, and there is still a major health crisis. The path to under 100 report is a roadmap that outlines how to reduce the number of those detained at Rosie's by at least 70%. The strategies include investing in gender responsive community resources and diversion programs that meet the specific needs of women and gender expansive people. Shiro is an example of a transitional housing program that has diverted over 300 from Rosie's in the past five years with only two rearrests at the fraction of the cost of keeping someone in jail. Conduct a holistic needs assessment early on that identify domestic violence, housing, mental health, caregiver status, and other factors that should be used in decisions throughout the case and to connect those advocates with resources. Establish a population review team that brings together stakeholders to review every individual case at Rosie's and facilitate non-jail alternatives. Provide accessible, current information on the demographics and resources available for those at Rosie's, including a citywide women's resource navigator. The Board of Corrections can make a difference in decarceration, and the women and gender expansive people at Rosie's should be a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Asano Simmons, no, I've said that. Thank you. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to voice my opinions and my thoughts. My name is Batamara Selen. Um, I live in Brooklyn. I am the mother of Mia, who is currently housed at Rose Beach and Stater Center. She has been here for over three years. Mia doesn't deserve to be here. Before she went to Rose Beach, she's never gotten in trouble in her life. She's never been arrested. She was working with disabled children. She had just passed the five flight of exam. She was about to start college. Um, Mia ends up at Rosie's for defending herself after she was attacked on the subway. Um, I work in for Mia Safety at Rosie's every day. Mia has been jumped while I was on the phone with her. Um, she tells me the girls are now getting cut. Everyone has weapons at Rosie's and nothing is being done. Um, after Mary and Yuta died, it shook the women. They're not getting medical attention. They're missing medical appointments because now when they go out to go onto the bridge, the doors are being opened for other inmates to come from other units to cut and fight them. So they're scared to go to medication. My daughter hasn't been to physical therapy in over three years. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just emotional, please forgive me. Um, there are not enough sanitary napkins. When they ask for things, officers make fun of them. An officer has told my daughter, you're never leaving, why don't you just kill yourself? Mm. My daughter just turned 24. She's been there since she was 19 years old. Um, it is, to go there to see her, it is physically, mentally exhausting. Mothers and daughters who are Rosie's have their lo loved ones there have been forgotten in the stories about Rikers. They deserve safety, dignity, and respect. On August 25th was Mia's birthday. I cannot believe another year has passed. She's still spending Rosie. She should not be there. A judge has promised her on three different occasions to release her, to give her an ATI, even a bracelet. Then she was, again, she was again denied, even though there's a spot for her. Um, it has never happened. She was in a community program where she could move ahead with her education. This year she was valedictorian in Rosie's. She was given a four-year scholarship to John Jay College, and I want to see her thrive in this new opportunity. But instead of Mia's, Mia's moving forward, her spirit is broken. She's afraid for her life at Rosie's because she has asthma, and she has asthma attacks. It takes minutes and hours for them to come and get her. So, you know, she's afraid. There doesn't seem any justice for her or any of the ladies that are at Rosie's. I ask for help to release women like Mia who deserve care and support. And, and to be treated humanely. For those who need higher level of care and security, Lincoln is a better alternative for the women in the city's jail. The, instead of the plan to move them to Kew Gardens. Um, please do the right thing and keep my daughter and the other women safe and closing up. I'm asking by saying, to please, excuse me, and closing i like to begin by saying thank you again for letting me share my voice. As a mom, I'm pleading for the lives of my daughter and the other ladies at Rosie's. Thank you and God bless you all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Young. 
I am the Civil Rights Campaign Coordinator at Vocal New York. Um, Vocal, along with Freedom Agenda, Halt Solitary, Jails Action Coalition, Visionary V, and Women's Community Justice Association, joined together ahead of the Board of Corrections hearing this morning to demand decarceration. We know, because we've experienced it, that anyone sent to Rikers Island is subjected to the potential of the death penalty. So in support of our organization's long-term goal of ending pretrial detention, we are requesting that the Board of Correction adopt the following demands as part of its recommendations to address the crisis on Rikers Island. One, issue an official call for decarceration, including a demand to release all people and stop sending people to these deadly jails. Two, with the ultimate goal of releasing everyone from Rikers, call for the immediate release of the following categories of people. Pregnant people, all women, all transgender people, all gender non-conforming people, people with mental health needs, people with chronic health problems, people with city sentences. Three, require an actionable commitment to harm reduction. Release all people with substance use needs. Demand transparency on the training of correction staff on the carrying and administering of Narcan. Ensure that staff with mental health training are placed in units with those with mental health complexities. Provide individual first aid kits that include fentanyl test strips to everyone detained in a way that eliminates any possibility of retaliation or further prosecution. Reconvene the Suicide Prevention Task Force, complete suicide prevention trainings for all staff, and expand the use of suicide prevention aids. Four, in the use of solitary confinement. Support the passage of Intro 549, a bill to end the barbaric practice of solitary confinement in New York City jails. Five, order Mayor Eric Adams to close the pipeline that feeds Rikers, as he puts it, no later than November 1st. This plan should adopt recommendations laid out by the Commission on Community Reinvestments and the closure of Rikers Island in their 2021 report that addresses the root causes and drivers of criminalized behavior. Six, require the city to create and sustain a pathway for stability for those leaving DOC facilities. This includes halting the plans to close the city's six re-entry hotels. The hotels have contributed to lower recidivism rates and public safety. Closing them will only strengthen the pipeline to Rikers that Mayor Adams claims to want to close. Also support the passage of the Fair Chance for Housing Act, a bill to end housing discrimination for people with criminal records. And finally, address gendered harm on Rikers. Establish accountability metrics for the implementation of the Prison Rape Elimination Act that includes women, trans, and gender expansive people. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My name is Eileen Marr, and I am a woman who is a community activist, and I was formerly incarcerated and a survivor of, Rose, of Rosie's at Rikers Island. I'm a civil rights union leader with Vocal, Vocal New York, as well as a social worker, community activist. I spent over 420 days on that godforsaken landfill before unnecessarily taking a plea and drafting upstate. One of the main reasons I felt compelled to do this was, as it continues to be, the dangerous, neglectful, corrupt, and torturous environment that thrives so abundantly on the island and its borough support jails. I would love to say things have improved since I left the island, that New York has begun to remedy some of their wrongs within the Department of Corrections. However, just the opposite has occurred. Oh, and by the way, the drugs, weapons, and other paraphernalia enter the facility not by mail, not by visits or packages, but by the corrections officers transporting them in. Anyway, despite systemic changes, albeit slow and small, in local and state laws and policies, Rikers has instead turned from a torture island to a death island. 
Over the past nine months, 13 people have been murdered while in the care and custody of the New York City Department of Corrections. All but one of the individuals were not convicted of a crime. They were simply detainees. Not one of the human beings who perished had received a court-mandated death warrant. New York does not have a death penalty statute, or so I thought. The most recent death that occurred, Mr. Nieves. Three, not one, not two, but three officers sat and watched as this man slit his own throat and bled out. They watched rather than notify a medical professional or even push the pin on their utility belt, notifying the compound of an emergency. They had three pins among them to choose from. However, then, however rather than save the life of a fellow human being, they chose to watch and allow him to die like it was a spectator sport or something. When I was a detainee, and from what I've been told by other detainees since, the officers would encourage them, detainees who were experiencing suicidal ideations, to quote unquote, go through with it, saying things like, hurry up and do it, need a rope, or just hang it up already and kill yourself. This is exhausting. Every couple of weeks we are here, my fellow activist comrades and I speaking out about yet another preventable death of one of my sisters and brothers that occurred while, DNC, while on DLC watch. When will it end? Individuals who are detained on the island are not getting medication and medical appointments. Corrections officers and DOC staff continue to violate the Taylor laws and absent themselves from upwards of two or more shifts in a row. As a result, detainees are locked in their cells for sometimes 10 to 20 hours in a row, sometimes even more. They are not only not being provided their meals, but medications are not being provided, especially for those with chronic illnesses such as diabetes, mental illnesses, sickle cell and other anemias, cancer, and medically assisted substance abuse treatment, and plus a myriad of other illnesses. And the women are not receiving products to use during their menstruation. Toilets and sinks are breaking down beyond repair. Human beings are forced to go to the bathroom in plastic bags and drink water out of the toilet bowl. Blankets, ha! Some detainees do not even have a mattress, never mind sheets or blankets. When officers do bother to come in and work their shift, they are usually only there to traffic in weapons, alcohol, and fentanyl-invested narcotics. Oh, and of course, instigate and engage detainees in physical altercations or sexually assault and rape det detainees. And rather than attempt to fix these egregious human rights violations and save lives and heal, the DOC and Mayor Adams are doubling down on the mistreatment and abuse and demanding that despite it being illegal as per New York state law, solitary confinement continue to be utilized. Solitary confinement has been medically determined to be torture and permanently damaged to a person's mental health. It's almost like they want to torture or murder people. Maybe they do. Clearly, the DOC in New York City have proven that they are beyond incapable of operating and maintaining any kind of order and organization within their facilities. It goes without saying that they do not value human life and instead would prefer carte blanche access and tools so they can continue to legally murder human beings entrusted to their care and custody. They need to be removed entirely from any and all operations. The law to close Rikers Island passed years ago at this point. What needs to happen is that closure, mu closure must be expedited. This can begin with moving the women from Rosie's to their own freestanding facility in Manhattan. Terminate the employee employment of the entire Department of Corrections and replace them with properly trained, educated, and vetted healers. Couple this with the massive fusion of community services such as improved mental and physical health services, especially in underserved neighborhoods. Housing, supportive housing, improved educational services and programs, a mass infusion of domestic violence services and programs, alternatives to incarceration, and of course, violence interrupters. And rather than selling ill-equipped and barely trained police officers on mental health calls, send trained and properly vetted mental health professionals to intervene and begin the healing process. We can't have one more person die. Please stop the utter disregard for human life and, uh, within and around the New York City Department of Corrections. All of our lives are depending upon it. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. Um, so we're now going to a WebEx version. Uh, 
Um, so for those who have registered to speak via WebEx platform, when you hear your name, please raise your hand using the hand icon below the participants list on the WebEx screen. If you don't see the participants list, click on the silhouette of a person on the menu at the bottom of your screen. Once you open the participants list, you will see the hand icon to raise your hand. When you raise your hand, we will unmute you and you'll be able to turn on your video. You can then begin your public comment. I will let you know when it's been three minutes and we will move to the next speaker. As always, the board also welcomes written comments. You can email the written comments to to Lafayette Street, 12th floor, room 1221, New York, New York, 10007. I will now call our first speaker, uh, Fleming Smith from the Urban Justice Center. Fleming, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me? Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Fleming Smith, and my colleague Samantha Colson will be speaking after me. We are local interns with the Urban Justice Center's Mental Health Project, and we're here to share a testimony from a person incarcerated on Rikers Island. It includes discussions of self harm. I was in solitary in GDRC for three months this winter. I did 30 days in solitary and a little over two months in enhanced special housing. The ESH, to be honest with you, is the same thing as the box. It's mentally draining. It's physical torture. I wasn't allowed outside my cell. Sometimes we get showers, some days we don't. The only time I was let out of my cell was for the shower or for recreation, and they barely call back. I remember there was a time where I went two months without having any breath, just because the officers would say that they were short on staff. But they would take a list for rec at 6 o'clock in the morning when nobody is up. A lot of times the officers don't want to do their job. They'll just do around so that the camera can see them. But rec is mandatory, and everyone is supposed to be entitled to one hour of rec a day. Even in AMKC, an hour of ESH, and an hour of rocks, they don't even call work every day here. The last time I had work was a week ago. Staff is an excuse. They say we're short on staff. Especially when I was in the box, they always said they were short on staff. I was in a cell where the windows didn't open and it was constantly hot. I was there in the winter, so it was cold and they had the heater running. But my window didn't open and the heat was blasting so hot that I couldn't wear clothes in my cell. At night, I sweated myself to sleep. It would be so hot that I couldn't sleep. I would complain, but no one would say that they could do anything. They tried to see if they could put me in a cell where the window opened, but the box was always full. My time in the box started after I was waiting for something someone else did. I am not the person who went to the box store even though other people were involved. Our tickets were written by the same officer, but they said different things. Mine said that I alone did it, and his ticket said that he alone did it. Hearing officer about the tickets, but they found me guilty. I appealed that over five months ago, but I haven't heard anything from anybody. No one answered my appeal. They put me in ESH after I did 30 days in the box. I was supposed to have an ESH hearing to explain why they put me there, but I never had a hearing. ESH is no different from the box because you don't get out of your cell at all. I was in ESH for over 60 days. In total, I did almost 100 days confined to a cell. It happens that the reason I didn't have a hearing was because of my house was asymptomatic for COVID-19, but they never did any adjournment, so this never gave me a hearing. I'll now pass it to my colleague, Samantha Colson, to continue the testimony. Samantha, please unmute yourself.
and the diagnosis of anxiety, PTSD, and depression. ABC is found in the bottom of this page. Yeah, we're having a great deal of trouble hearing you. It's sort of every other word. I, I'm not sure if it's on Four your members. end or our end. But it's you, our end. Okay. It's our end. And I, I apologize for the technical problems we've been having today in our first uh, hybrid meeting. Um, I understand that the, um, some of the feeds have been choppy um, or some of the camera work has been a little blurry. Um, certainly not intentional. We're doing the best we can with this first try back to life, uh, back to life meetings. But if you could please submit uh, either, if you could please submit it in writing as well, we'll make sure it ends up on the website in its entirety. And apologies. But please keep going if you think it might get better. Uh, Records right of work, people aren't getting the very basic necessities that they need. In the box where students are doing days without showering, it's hard for people to use the phone. Guys are getting the right there to get People don't even want to come here to visit a person. That puts a person in a messed up space when your loved one doesn't even want to come see you because they will be treated like an inmate just because the phone is committed to you. I know they are talking about shutting it down, and I really hope it happens. I just pray that I can make a mistake for you because I know that this can be very traumatic on anybody. It is sad that people lost their lives by coming. Thank you. Um, Jonathan Cortez. And 
this should this happen, uh, the, the users will be charged exorbitant fees for having these use cases, as well as their families. Um, more specifically, uh, to send an email, you have to attach stamps. Stamps come at a cost. Uh, phone calls can cost. Uh, famously, someone got uh, several people got charged twenty five dollars for a phone call. Uh, now we're saying you know they're charging much less. Fifty five dollars to listen to this in the cloud. Uh, one of one of the securities who was contracted with uh, prisons in uh, across the nation. Uh, they wrote in the contract that the clause leads to the limitation of the business. Uh, this actually happened in New York City when uh, security was uh, contracted uh, with the Department of Protection, which is basically a multi state uh, agreement where it would have to go in front of the board or there would have to be a hearing or anything on it. Um, city Council passed a law that required the implementation to be free of charge. And that basically uh, did away with the uh, agreement. Earlier in this meeting, one of the uh, board members uh, was talking about the importance of programming, particularly programming to youth. And of, of course, a hallmark of programming is education. The really concerning dynamic here with the prospective introduction of JFA talents is the potential for them to extract Pell Grant dollars from students uh, using an online provider of higher education, such as National University, who they uh, work, have been working with for a number of years. Uh, in fact, the learning management system, Lantern, was created in conjunction with one of the higher-ups at Ashton University. And that is a learning management system that they currently, um, and that they encourage uh, higher education prison programs to charge Students anywhere from one hundred dollars per student to two hundred fifty dollars per student. So right now we're moving from uh, a place where education is provided free of charge to being incarcerated, uh, including on the uh, loaded uh, education loaded technology that was in place to uh, a state where education is going to be less accessible and it's going to be accessible at a cost to the incarcerated and potentially the families. Uh, moreover, there's the threat of um, and sorry, Mr. Cortez. Know, effectively cutting off uh, providers that are local-based, uh, making access more difficult. Apologies, these, uh, uh, you're, you're, you've exceeded the time limit, these but if you could just finish up, that would be helpful. I'm sorry. Sorry, you've exceeded the time limit, but if you could just finish mm -hmm. up, that would, that would be fine. And, okay, yeah. and we'll take it, the, the entire time. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, if, if, if you exceed the timeline, then please make sure that your, your entirety of your testimony is given to us in paper so we can make sure it's on the website or by email. Um, and the next speaker is Julia Solomon. Julia, you can go ahead and take yourself off of mute.
Kentucky social worker, desperate and afraid of harm, and he was going to cause himself, and the social worker elevated the request within DHS. DHS then responded that it was the DOC's responsibility to move the client. But when we inquired with DOC, they shared that there was only one psychiatrist available on staff to complete the required evaluations for upwards of 60 people waiting to be transferred to specialized mental health units, and that there's only room for three to four people in the tents where the evaluations happen, causing a huge backlog. People experiencing mental health crises are just not safe in the jail. There is nothing unclear about that, and something must be done. Um, additionally, many of our incarcerated clients are victims of physical assault, which leave them with serious injuries that, if not treated properly, can be life-altering. Uh, despite this, DOC routinely fails to produce our clients with specialist appointments, often for many months and sometimes up to a year. Many of our clients are facing lifelong medical consequences and long-term disabilities, such as permanent nerve damage, mobility issues, eyesight loss, among other consequences due to DOC's negligent pattern of non-production. Even with our advocacy, our clients continue to face months of waiting with no end in sight, and they will continue to suffer from this negligence long after their time in custody. These are permanent consequences. Um, we acknowledge and appreciate the board's most recent report surrounding suicides um, and troubling the risks in custody, and the recommendation issued for CHS and DOC, but we agree with other advocates that share today that the recommendations are not enough. Um, we urge the board to do tangible, concrete follow-up with both agencies, and we need a firm timeline for implementing urgently needed changes to the way our clients are receiving care in custody. Uh, and that's going to require meaningful intervention on the part of the board. We also encourage the board to speak directly to as many people in custody as they possibly can, to be tracking the patterns that they see in the 311 reports, and reaching out and talking to people directly about what they're sharing in those reports. We also strongly urge board members to all be visiting the jails more frequently, and to utilize defenders and other advocates as a resource to help guide their efforts. Um, just lastly, my last few seconds, I just want to share about programming. Um, the Deputy Commissioner of Programs is not available today, but I do encourage the board to look more into what programming is actually being offered to clients in custody. We regularly hear from our clients that they are desperately seeking programming. They have nothing to occupy their time or their minds, um, and programming is critical for, for public safety. Our clients need something to be doing during the days, and there just is nothing available to them in the facilities right now. Um, so we just want to please ask the board to make sure that programming is available to our clients um, soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kayla Simpson from the Legal Aid Society. Kayla, are you there? It is, yes. Um, give us one second, Kayla. Oops. Kayla, are you there? Kayla, can you please give us one second so we can make sure that the board uh, is able to hear you? One second. Thank you for your patience. Uh, just a, it'll be a few moments. Is she with us? She is. 
So Amanda, right now it's the, uh, their system that they're connected to is reconnecting to the WebEx meeting, which would allow all the sound to come through. Go ahead. So we're waiting for their system to reconnect. Okay. Okay, so hopefully this will be brief and then we'll be able to hear everyone much better. Um, during the pause, I did want to make one comment about the, the dedicated lines for people in custody to use. Um, this was our first time ever ever doing this, um, and we we uh, went through a lot of deliberation and discussion about how best to do it, um, and made a decision that we would speak with people if we thought their message might be problematic, and make sure they had legal counsel and were aware and understanding that um, their message would be played unedited and unredacted in a public forum. Some people, um, upon hearing that or upon listening to legal advice, did retract their messages and some people didn't. And we made a decision not to censor the people who left messages on our line when you know we had clear warnings and caveats before they left the message. But um, we will think about the commentary that we got in response to those messages um, and appreciate um, having some public comment, address the public comment. And we definitely, definitely will um, go back to the drawing board and think about it again. Um, when Amanda was speaking, we still couldn't hear. Test? Yeah, I still don't hear in the... I'm so, I'm so sorry, but I, I can't hear you if you're telling me something or not. Hello. Kayla, you Kayla, can go you ahead and give your, uh, your, your comments. We can hear you. Kayla, uh, you were doing great, and uh, unfortunately, we are not hearing you. Now we can see you. So see, see, yes. We can see you, but we can't hear you, so just a few moments.
Can you try speaking now, Kayla? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah. uh, where did I lose you? That 2022. 2022. That in 2022. In 2022, thank you. Nine months into a new administration, the callous disregard for human rights is some of the most oppression of the world in this country. And we need to look no further back than the CPD scale as officers wash out white lives and make us pull down for it. I think we need to sift the set. For human beings to behave in this way, for other human beings, is brokenness. And those violence that have been said, thank, thank you for referencing them, are, are not evidence of an agency. And I think all of that would be the same thing with me, which is that the board has an ongoing sexual also plan because DOC continues to show and show today that it cannot prove itself and it will not follow through this information. And I think we need this board to put self-harm on your agenda every month and demand the answer that they did not give to the report and did not give today every month for what progress they've made on these recommendations. And then issue notice of the violations And I want to make one more point, and thank you for your patience if you don't mind. Um, second, thanks so much for raising the lockdowns issue. And to add one point about it, regarding uh, our Adam case, in which the department expressed the incontent of the court order to provide access to medical care, we wanted to point out the connection uh, to data about missed medical appointments and lockdowns. We've talked about failure to provide access to clinics, of course, um, of which there are over 300 in just July. July. But that's not the only number that got worse. In July alone, there were over 1,300 missed medical appointments due to lockdowns and alarms. Those disrupt mandated services, and that causes a sickness and harm. And that's just but one illustration of the hybrid of dysfunction and consistency that requires a close look. Because, of course, the suspension of a lockdown standard doesn't suspend the duty to provide access to medical care during the lockdown. So, we encourage the board to continue to monitor lockdowns. Thank you so much for raising it and following up today. And alarms and data reported by the agency very closely. And then issue notes of the violation of the agency standards that we have had and continue to find us what we find. Um, and we thank you very much and for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Kelly Grace Price.
next speaker is Lucas Marquez. Uh, Lucas, you can uh, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Lucas Marquez. I'm the Associate Director of Solar Rights and Law Reform and Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, we just wanted to talk a little bit on, about the lockdowns, um, the excessive lockdowns we've heard today, um, and how frequently they've been this summer. Um, DOC provided today that they're using the lockdowns as part of quote black health reduction plan. As described, seemingly to be a pre preemptive initiative rather than a response to something actionable. Such preemptive action and the frequency of use must be weighed against the significant harm that these lockdowns are doing to the people in custody. The lockdowns are not temporary, as you know. Certain of these lockdowns have been extended for multiple days in a row, some around a week or more. During this time, there's no access to regular showers, commissary phones, or medical treatment. Uh, BDS and other advocates can raise these issues in real time with DOC and notify the board, um, but did not receive a response from DOC. Um, it is particularly troubling um, where the use of lockdown practice has increased over the course of the year, and there is not a correlation always between incidents of violence and the length of the lockdown. Um, and just to talk a little bit more about what Kayla was mentioning about the access to medical care and the lockdown. DOC um, continues to fail to ensure medical access in July. Um, from June to July, the number of scheduled medical appointments remain the same, but the number of missed appointments in July doubled do due to lockdowns and increased from about 200 to 1,000 due to alarms. Um, you know, we, we just ask DOC to continue to monitor lockdowns, um, you know, to work with the advocates, uh, you know, so that we can have more information about the people in custody where we're hearing about lockdowns, and also to review and assess DOC data. Um, and the last point I wanted to raise was regarding protective custody and safety transfers. We've been having a lot of issues getting people um, in custody evaluated for and into protective custody or safe units. Even where evaluation is ordered by the court, and we raise it with DOC, we raise it with DOC again, um, it, it's been very difficult to ensure that people um, who ask for and want to be placed in protective custody are put into these units. Um, this includes people who have suffered sexual and physical assaults. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Moira Marquis. to a for-profit organization that is only seeking their, their enrichment. 
as COVID-19 and the other people who have been talking about the lockdowns demonstrate the library access along with programming can be restricted or entirely eliminated from whole facilities for days, weeks, even years. And so maximum access to reading materials and information is part of keeping people sane and safe. And tablets should not be used as an excuse to limit the physical books or other reading materials, but they should definitively not be paid for by tax dollars or people who are incarcerated for the enrichment of the private corporation. We appreciate um, this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Natalie Fiorenzo. Hi, there. Can you all see and hear me okay? Yes. Yes? Okay, please let me know if that does change. Um, I just like to start by saying that I'm not sure if you all are aware, but the public link has not been working um, this morning, so I do vote, especially because the Department of Corrections did leave before the public comment session, that it is being recorded so that they can at least hear individuals in their custody speaking up. Um, it is. Okay. Um, all right, now I'll give you my testimony. My name is Natalie Fiorenzo, and as a correction specialist at New York County Defendant Services, I speak to our incarcerated clients every day. Um, and I can definitively tell you, despite the points made this morning, Rikers Island remains a living hell. For my testimony today, I will share just a handful of the human rights violations that we've reported to DOC legal and exactly how effectively they have been addressed um, since the last meeting. On July 12th, GRDC Unit 5B was locked in for five days without access to regular meals, medical treatment, or phone calls. They could shower, but the showers were filled with sewage. On July 14th, corrections officers in GRDC Unit 5A purposefully opened cell doors in order to allow a detainee all the patients. On July 18th, the client housed in West facility was not permitted to drink clean water, shower, use the phone, or have access to commissary for four days. On July 19th, a client was held on Rikers for a week past his release date because the Department of Corrections staff did not realize that the charges holding him in were actually made void months prior. On July 20th, a client held at Rosie's was being threatened by corrections officers and other detainees. When she reported it to Priya, she was told that she would have to fight fellow detainees if she wanted to be transferred to a different on July 21st, one of our young adult clients housed in Building 12 at Rosie's, a mental health unit, looked in her cell for 24 hours a day. Is there a problem? Yeah, it's a little choppy. So I'm going to turn off my video. Okay. 
I'm sorry, but could you wrap it up? You are, you are past time, just in all fairness. Okay, in all fairness, I think everyone is past time today. Um, and I have been speaking more slowly due to the technical difficulties. You do have technical difficulties, so so go ahead and finish. But in all, you know, I'm attempting to keep it fair. Um, we, we were trying not to let people go over time, but if you insist. I do insist, thank you. Um, the investigation decision refuses to talk to us and redirects us back to DOT legal, leaving us with no answers. And that's only when they do respond because oftentimes they don't at all. Um, I implore the board to ensure a much higher sense of urgency and responsibility from the legal division and a streamlined, effective source of communication with the investigation decision. We should not have to spend days figuring out what rights to cut through when we're trying to remove our clients from a dorm where we will be stabbed in the next 12 hours. These incidences demonstrate the department ignoring its own policies and failing to address very real danger to our clients. These are the same dangers that allowed for 15 deaths in 2021 and 13 this year so far. Okay. The board needs to start publicly advocating for a receivership in city jail because cut people are dying and others are being traumatized for life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and to the extent you have concerns and you want to raise them with us, I am always there and I often talk to people in, among the defenders and you can reach me in my office. The next speaker is Serena Townsend. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, my name is Serena Townsend. I'm a partner at Criminal Defense and Civil Litigation Firm, Townsend, Nicola, and Maris Law, and I'm a consultant with Campaign Bureau. Formerly, as you know, I was the Deputy Commissioner of the Intelligence Investigation and Trials Division at the New York City Department of Corrections. I want to thank you for holding this hearing and for increasing oversight and investigation into DOC. Today, I will focus on metrics. Because four months ago at a hearing on May 24th, DOC told Judge Laura Swain that it could stave off federal receivership with its day recycled action plan. The question was asked, how would we progress, how would progress and success be measured under this action plan in order to avoid federal receivership? The answer given by DOC was metrics. Judge Swain allowed DOC to determine what metrics would be measured by and to present its progress in November. DOC was literally allowed to run its own test and given six months to pass. When Judge Swain specifically asked DOC, is it your position that there are no legal, contractual, regulatory, or state law barriers to prevent you from coming into compliance, the answer given was yes, and that the metrics would prove it. So let's take a look at the metrics as they stand, with six weeks left to go until the November hearing. Since that year in May, eight more people have died on Rikers Island bringing the total to 13 this year alone. 14 if you count the correction officer who died days ago on the island while working his post. That's almost one death every two weeks since the action plan was implemented. Slashings and stampings of detainees are up 40% from last year's horrific numbers. Mass absenteeism is still a problem. Use of force is up according to the controller's dashboard. The department has not posted the pre-540 report, which is now a month overdue. Likely because for the first time in years they've fallen out of compliance. Claims of data transparency and progress have been proven over and over to be false or misleading. Those are the metrics. A federal receivership is necessary. The argument for a receiver is that a receiver, by definition, circumvents archaic rules that currently prevent DOC from hiring talented, uniformed leaders, swiftly disciplining officers changing sick leave rules, and expediting procurement of things like doors that lock, and technology to move DOC away from paper-based systems. I recommend anybody interested in learning more about receivership go to www.rikersisland.org. I just want to say real quick from the testimony today that I heard, there was an excuse for the lock-ins um, given, that it was because investigation committee was referring to use of force. I will tell you, um, <laughs> that based on my experience in creating thousands of use of force on Riker Island, that's extremely suspect testimony. And secondly, the idea that investigators are patrolling facilities to prevent contraband from coming in via staff, uh, I would be shocked if that were true, and I encourage the board to ask the department for their reports from the investigation division. 
not from today and onward, but from before today, on whether that's actually happening. And you're I'm going to end with times. No problem. I'm wrapping it up. Great. Yes, I held DOC staff accountable for over five years. But before that, I was a prosecutor for a decade. I worked with law enforcement to bring justice to literally thousands of crime victims. The public has heard me rally for detainees. Hear me when I also say this. Correction officers would also benefit from a federal receiver. They are working cruel hours. They need better yeah, leaders and time. better training. The officers who come to work while their colleagues play sick, the ones who do their job honestly while others bring in contraband and scam overtime, they are victims of this mismanagement and their corrupt union too. If metrics show that DOC can't keep detainees forced to act alive on record items, if DOC cannot pass its own metrics test, then receivership is the only safe option. Thank you so much for your time and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. The public comment period is concluded. Uh, the board's next public meeting is scheduled for October 18th at 9 a.m. We will provide meeting details on our website and we will send an email to interested parties. Without hearing any objection, the meeting is now adjourned. Second. You know, Jack, we're going to have to put Torres on the carpet. I want to know. Why is it that our detainees receive a dollar, a, a dollar ten an hour for working for the summer youth employment when everybody else?